shall we make a start? Yes, I think it's a good time to make a start. All right, so welcome everyone to the final session of Numerous Numerosity. Uh, sadly for us, uh, I had uh, such a blast this week that it feels, feels strange to present uh, the last session. So we have um, Kevin Bossert with us today. He's going to talk about how to teach computers about numbers, which is a very enticing title I'm looking forward to hear more about. Of course, uh, as a final instance, if you didn't uh, already know, uh, this is part of a larger conference called Numerous Numerosity, where we explore the nature of numbers. Um, and so in this last session, Laura is going to be moderating. So over to you, Laura. Yes, thank you, Carlos. I am delighted to present Kevin Bussard as the last speaker of this conference. Uh, he is a professor of pure mathematics at Imperial College London. He is a number theorist by training, but recently has become interested in computer theorem provers. And we thought it would be great, perhaps even necessary, to have a pure mathematician in this conference. And in particular, we are delighted to have you, Kevin, as someone who has worked on the more formal side of numbers, which is the general theme of the conference, and who is currently involved in computer proof verification and just thinking in general about the future of mathematics, we thought you would have a unique perspective to complement the rest of the panel. So very glad that you accepted our invitation. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, my, it's also my turn, I think, and all of us really, to, it's our turn to say thank you to you uh, for organizing this conference. It's been very interesting. I. As as Lara said, I'm a number theorist, and uh, so I think about I, I think about pro, you know I think about how numbers behave in some kind of abstract mathematical universe, and uh, I spend a lot of time sort of developing tools and using tools uh, that that you know to 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 prove things and you know make progress with questions, abstract questions involving numbers, questions that might have no sort of physical meaning and uh i've come along this week and i've seen so many people who you know, are really engaging with the idea of number but for lots and lots of very different uh, lots and lots of very different reasons and uh it's it's been absolutely fascinating i you know every, every talk i every talk i saw i learned i learned many things from it's been an absolutely fascinating week so thank you very much to carlos and laura for uh for organizing this conference and uh thank you to those of you who are watching and uh, uh, let's get going. So I'm gonna, we're gonna grow some numbers in the lab, right? We're gonna, we're gonna grow some abstract, uh, we're gonna grow some abstract mathematical numbers in some kind of lab. So I'm gonna start by explaining what the lab is. And, uh, and then we're gonna talk about, you know, we're gonna witness the birth, the miracle of birth. Uh, we're gonna see the birth of number. And uh, these numbers, when they're born, they're going to be like humans when they're born. They're going to be very primitive. They're not going to really know how to do anything with themselves or each other. And, uh, and so they're going to have to be nurtured. So we're going to we're going to show them, you know, we're going to teach them how to add themselves up, things like this. And uh, and when we've done that, we're going to step back a bit and, and ask uh, what the point of doing experiments in this kind of lab is. Uh, so I need to really go on uh, to talk about what I mean by a lab. I mean, somehow, if you if you like the mathematician's lab, uh, is the is you know is the Platonic universe or you know the mathematician's universe. This is this is where mathematics was done for you know thousands of years. These people like Euclid that were you know drawing drawing triangles and squares and rectangles on papyrus. These people were envisaging these things as existing in some abstract platonic universe uh, but I've, i'm going to show you a different kind of lab uh, in this talk so the kind of lab we're going to talk about is uh, is uh, a, somehow a computer generated lab you know, it's, it's like a virtual lab in some it's 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 different to this abstract lab that we imagine as mathematicians this abstract mathematical universe and it looks it looks like this i'll just i'll just show you now it looks uh, there it is. It's you know, it's 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 a computer program, but it's not sort of running or anything like this. It's just waiting. It's a sandbox. Uh, it's it's waiting to be told what to do. I'm going to talk a bit about what a computer is uh, for those of you that don't really, you know, think about the nature of computers. Uh, but th this is the lab, uh, a place we'll be spending some time in uh, during this talk. 
and uh, the lab we're going to be using is an interactive theorem prover, uh, which is, a, as I say, a kind of computer program. Uh, and the one, and the one we, I mean, there are many interactive theorem provers. The one I'm going to be using is called Lean, uh, which is free and open source software written by Microsoft Research. Sorry, Kevin, uh, if you advance the screen, it, it hasn't uh, hasn't changed. We still still see your title page. Oh, really? Yes. That's, I'm really glad you told me that because I showed you an interactive theorem prover. Uh, right, well, let's, my screen sharing is paused. You're absolutely right. Uh, no, it's all right, I'll, I wonder why it says my screen sharing is, yeah, why not? I'll stop sharing uh, and I'll share again. Let's try sharing this. There we go. There's ah, and now it, and now what do you see? It's see your ID. We see your screen. You, do you see an interactive fear improver? No. We see your VS. Yes. Yes. Code. We see. We see Lean. Oh, oh, great! You see Lean. Okay, wonderful. Uh, or an editor, at least. Yeah, you see an editor. Do you see? Do you see me typing? You see me typing junk. Yes. yes. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Uh, so let me go back to uh, the slides. Look, I'll show you. Uh, there. There we go. That was the, that was the things I was saying. Uh, what's the lab and the birth of number and making numbers work? And then what's the point? I, I said all those things, but that was what you should have been seeing. Uh, and now here's my announcement that we're going to use an interactive theorem prover. So you can see the words making the lab. We're going to use an interactive theorem prover. Yes. Wonderful. So let's go. So, so, so this is lean. Uh, let me switch. There's lean. And I'm switching back. There you go. Uh, and this is free open source software written by Microsoft. And there's, there's several other interactive theorem provers. They tend all to be free open source software. Uh, and this is, this is the, this is the place. This is the place here where we're going to grow, where we're going to grow these numbers. And, uh, this is our virtual lab, and you see, it's a it's a step forward. Uh, it, it's in some sense progress because instead of having to instead of having to imagine the mathematical universe, uh, which is you know which is what mathematicians would be doing. Mathematicians imagine the mathematical universe, and then they communicate facts about the mathematical universe. Uh, for example, by writing on blackboards, you know they they explain mathematical ideas which are taking place within the mathematical universe. And they write them on blackboards historically, uh, or more recently, they write them in PDF files, and uh, they send these PDF files to each other, or they give they give talks like the talk I'm giving now. And this is a way that information is uh, is, is transmitted between mathematicians, and you know different mathematicians can learn uh, new things about about the mathematical universe. So this is some kind of, if you like, a simulation of the mathematical universe, and it provides a new way. Of a, you know, for mathematicians to pass information to each other. So that's the lab we're going to be using. And, uh, and, this lab, and this lab is being simulated within a computer. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what computer is uh, before we go on. So you see, you might, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to explain to you is that we're going to be making numbers in a lab and you might think about your model of a computer or a calculator, for example, and you kind of think, well, this is ridiculous because I have a calculator in my pocket and uh, you know, you've got a calculator on your phone nowadays. When you were at school, you had a calculator in your maths class, perhaps. And uh, these calculators had numbers built in. And so, you know, and, and a computer is just some kind of elaborate calculator. And, uh, and a lot of people do use computers uh, to do complicated you know, calculations with numbers. Uh, and so fr from that point of view, you might be ex exceedingly unimpressed uh, that we're going to be doing numbers within a computer because, you know, computers have obviously got numbers built in somehow. Uh, so th this isn't quite uh, the full story, though. Uh, computers have traditionally been used to compute. I mean, we use massive computers to, uh, you know, to do simulations of, of you know, weather, you know, modeling uh, modeling weather and things like this and predicting, you know, predicting what the temperature will be this time next week. And, you know, you look on your favorite weather app and you see numbers 
and these numbers are the temperature you know these numbers are the things which the algorithm has spat out so clearly computers can be used to compute with numbers uh but the 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 thing i want to try and explain at the beginning of this talk uh, is that computers can also be used to do something else computers can also be used to reason uh, or to, to you know to prove things to prove theorems and uh in the uk at least uh when when you go through your mathematical education in the uk one has to you know what one is obliged to study mathematics up to the age of 16 and if you study mathematics up to the age of 16 then you see a lot of examples of computing you get you get taught uh you get taught how to do you know you get taught how to do computations you're told that john has got you know some apples and some oranges and you're told various slightly obscure facts about these apples and oranges and one is asked to compute how many apples and oranges john has it's the kind of silly question that my daughter has had to sit through for the last few years of her life uh and uh but there's very few occasions when people like my, my daughter's just she's just finished the last of her exams yesterday and uh and so and will now no longer be doing any more mathematics at least in the school system uh but she was also very occasionally asked to reason and she, she was shown circle theorems she was she she she, a typical question in this circle theorem thing, she would be shown a picture with a circle in and a bunch of lines, and she would be told to prove that this angle is equal to this angle. And there, you don't compute, you're not told, you see, you're not, you're not, you don't draw a picture and measure the angle and say, oh, this angle is 20 degrees and this angle is 40 degrees. So that one is clearly twice this one. She she was being asked to reason. Uh, she was being asked to uh you know, to 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 use facts. You know, there are things like angle, opposite angles, and you know, some parallel lines are equal. And she has to learn a whole bunch of things, which, if you like, are axioms. And then she's supposed to use these axioms. You know, one of them says the angle at the center is twice the angle at the circumference. And uh, this is one of the basic facts she has at her disposal. And she uses these basic facts to try and deduce more facts. So there, there we're doing mathematical reasoning, but we're not computing. You see, that's that's a, it's a different kind of mathematics. Uh, we're proving theorems. We're reasoning. And historically, computers were used to compute. And uh, but but they can. It's it's manifestly clear to everyone that computers can be used to do far more things than compute. I mean, nowadays you can book a holiday on your phone, right? And and the reason for that is that someone has made an app. Uh, They've written an app on you, you know, using your computer, and this app's primary concern is certainly not numbers. Uh, so we 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 see that you know, even though in the mathematics department we're often using computers to do computations, especially in the applied mathematics side of things, you know, we're simulating solutions to differential equations, or you know, we're trying to model various aspects of the physical world. But computers can also be used to reason, and what we'll be doing. Uh, today is we'll be using them in this different way and when we're using them to reason uh they might not know you know we, they might be in a state where they don't know about numbers at all you see so here's ada lovelace who i think historically was one of the very first people to realize it, it's absolutely fascinating reading lovelace's work I, I never i never looked at any of this stuff until i got interested in computers about four years ago and then i read uh some of lovelace's work and uh you can really see at the beginning this excitement. Computers didn't exist at this point, uh, but, but the idea of a computer uh, was beginning to come to pass. So Lovelace, um, Lovelace, you know, she was the, the, the daughter of Byron, the poet, and she fell in with this chap Babbage, uh, you know, this, this sort of crazy British inventor, I imagine him as. And uh, he'd made this machine, the difference engine. So this, the difference engine was created by Babbage. And, uh, and it was a machine that solved, you know, differential equations uh, numerically. And, uh, and, and Babbage wanted to go on uh, to use, to, to, you know, Babbage, Babbage had made this difference engine and wanted to make a new machine, this analytical engine. Uh, and the analytical engine is, would, in, in some sense, it, was the, it would have been the world's first computer. It was never designed. Uh, you know, we had to wait a long time before people like Turing came along and actual computers you know, even Turing, sort of 70 or so years later, 80 years later, uh, didn't have access to a computer. So this this analytical engine of Babbage was going to be the first computer. And he gave some lectures about it in Italy. And uh, notes were taken uh, 
notes were taken and uh, and Lovelace translated these notes into English and, uh, and and these translated notes were published and th so so the translation was done by Lovelace and then Lovelace also made some extra notes afterwards called, it's just called notes by the translator it's the, you know the last in this uh, volume published in 1850 something 1854 I think it was or maybe 1840s uh, notes by the translator where Lovelace is is lets her imagination run, run wild and talks about uh, you know she, she she has a clear understanding of both the difference engine and the analytical engine even though the analytical engine doesn't at this point exist and it turns out would never exist you know, in, in that form and uh, she talks about the difference engine which could solve these differential equations numerically and, and she points out the difference engine the difference engine can in reality do nothing but add she's in some sense she's seen through it the difference engine is an extremely elaborate calculator right there is some kind of difference between a calculator and a computer you know a calculator is very good at doing computations with numbers as is a computer but the calculator can't be programmed and uh, the difference engine similarly couldn't be programmed you had dials it had settings and you could uh, you could change the dials you know to make the difference engine do different calculations but at the end of the day, she could see that, you know, the, the difference engine could do things like multiplication, but multiplication, it would just do by repeated addition. And ultimately, the, the one thing it did, you know, the trick of the difference engine was that it could add, you know, the, the gears it had uh, were designed to add and that it would build on top of that. So and and actually, when you read it, there's some sort of in some sense, there's some sort of disdain she has with the difference engine. She, she refers to it later as just just an adding machine. Uh, and I think what's happened is her her mind has been opened uh, in these lectures of Babbage to the to the analytical engine, and uh, when she talks about the analytical engine, she can see she she's she's really one of the first people to understand the difference between a calculator and a computer. So she talks about the analytical engine, and she says it might act upon other things besides number. You know, she observes very very so it was 1842. She observes very very early on. The computers don't necessarily have to be computing with number. Uh, there, there's some sort of more underlying abstract thing that's going on. Uh, so, you know, it could add, act upon other things besides number where objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations. And the abstract science of oper these operations she's talking about, these are, these are now called functions. Uh, she's somehow, she's, she's isolated to the concept of a function and she's realized that actually these functions could be functions that go from you know anywhere to anywhere really they don't have to go to number and she goes on to talk about things like music and uh, suggesting that maybe in the future computers would be able to compose music and th you know this is a hundred years before you know before the first computer was ever built uh, but somehow she'd seen enough of Babbage's ideas so to begin to really understand and what could be done and she went on a, you know she wrote some programs she wrote some programs uh, that created functions uh, she she wrote a function that she wrote a function that you inputted a number ed and it outputted the nth Bernoulli number so she wrote a function that computed some numbers and this you know this function never ran because the computer it was made for was never built but uh, she began to understand that perhaps number wasn't the most fundamental thing and uh, so, you know, in our lab, our, this, this lean is a functional programming language. The, the fundamental object is a function. Types and functions are the fundamental things. And uh, we're going to have to build numbers from scratch, you see. That's where we're going. So, as I say, a calculator comes with this pre-installed idea of numbers, but a computer is actually more flexible. So we don't necessarily need numbers uh, to be doing computing. So... That's a description of the lab. We'll be going to the lab later. Uh, but before we go, to, we're going to go to the lab and we're going to make numbers. But before we do that, we need to we need to decide for ourselves what a number is. And you see that the problem is that historically, uh, numbers needed no definition. I suspect that Lovelace as well, we used to ask her what a number was. She would suggest that a number was a primitive concept. It was the sort of thing that didn't need a definition. It's, a, you know, it's just a thing that existed. So it's, you know, from... For, for 2000, for probably more than 2000 years. Uh, I, I, it's, it's not clear to me that there's too much evidence of people really trying to say what a number is. A number is just this, this obvious thing. But when people started thinking more abstractly about mathematics and uh, 
the things that math, you know, the, the tools that mathematicians use. Uh, this is when, you know, more more things started to appear. For example, you know, th this concept of a set arrived. You know, a set is just a collection of stuff. There is a set doesn't have a definition. If if we think of sets as the primitive things, a set is just a collection of stuff. Uh, then we could start trying to make the set of numbers. And now you see numbers are now an actual something that we can try and make. We can we can try and figure out how to make the set of numbers. And uh, people like von Neumann had uh, you know had ideas about this kind of thing. Uh, but we're not going to talk about von Neumann's definition. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be neo Dedekindian. This is I didn't I didn't know this is what it was called. I, one of the things I've learned from this conference. We're going to be neo Dedekindian, and uh, we're going to define numbers as uh, counting numbers. You know, we could be uh, Fre Fregian and uh, define numbers to be counting things, but we're not going to do that because uh, I don't really want to assume that things exist at all. You see, this is the point. I would assume that we start with a blank slate and uh, we're going to use numbers to count numbers. So we're going to use Piano's axioms. Uh, the, qu the question is, how are we going to define? There, there's the natural numbers. You know, they, do they start at zero? Do they start at one? It really depends on what you're doing. Uh, for the purposes of what I'm doing, it's more convenient to have them start at zero. Uh, but they could certainly start at one. It's very easy to adapt this talk. Uh, if, you, if your natural numbers start at one, and if you think that zero is a more suspicious object, then we could start at one. But I'm going to start at zero. And the idea is we want to come up with a finite list of rules that somehow completely encapsulates uh, these numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, the natural numbers, the way these things are thought of by pure mathematicians and, and here's Piano's idea so here's Piano's axioms I mean the, these axioms somehow did evolve they you know the, you know the, this was this whole idea was initialized by by work of Piers Piers and then Dedekind you know refined his ideas but you know the these axioms are typically now called Piano's axioms and you know they've been they've been mentioned before but for those of you that don't know them I'll go through them again. And the first, the first of Piano's axioms uh, is that zero is a number. We postulate the existence of zero. So zero is a number. And now, of course, the naive way to proceed would be to say, well, you know, one is a number, two is a number, three is a number. Uh, that would be one way of going about things. But of course, this would somehow be a disaster because then we'd end up with infinitely many axioms. Uh, and and somehow, the, the, in some sense, the axioms would be no different to the numbers we were trying to model. You know, we just we started off with an infinite collection of numbers, and we've we've ended up with an infinite collection of axioms. So that's not what's going to happen. The next axiom is not that that uh, that one is a number. The next axiom is simply that uh, every number has a successor. If you have a number, you know, this is the standard proof that we tell children: there's no. Why is there no biggest number? Why is a million, billion, trillion not the biggest number? It's because, because any number at all, there's a number after it, a million, billion, trillion, and one. That's the number after a million, billion, trillion. Uh, so this is, this is hypothesized by Piano. Every number has a successor, the number after it, uh, which, is, which is this number plus one, right? So zero has a successor, which is one. One has a successor, which is two. You see this, this very clever second axiom, uh, it, it gives us... We've we've straight we've straight away we've gone from one number. Yeah, you know, at the beginning we had no numbers, and then after the first axiom we had one number. But given this rule that every number has a successor, for every number there's a number after it. Now all of a sudden we have infinitely many numbers just in two axioms. So every number has a number after it, and uh, uh, and Piano's third. In fact, Piano originally had about ten axioms, but. Uh, but nowadays we've 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 kind of cut them down to this beautiful 20th 21st century format zero is a number every number has a successor uh, the number one greater than it and then piano's third axiom is that's it uh, which means there are no more ways to make numbers because if you think about it if you're just saying that we have zero we can add one then maybe we have the real numbers right because zero is a real number and given any real number like two we can add one to it and get three but given a number like pi we can add one to it. Uh, and so if you didn't say something else, then we wouldn't have isolated the natural numbers. We could have had, you know, there are many more classes of numbers we could have. We, we want to axiomatize the natural numbers. So this third axiom is very important. Uh, it says that that's the only way you can make numbers. Uh, and so let's, let's now switch to the lab. Uh, 
so here we are in the lab and i'm going to define uh and i'm going to define some numbers so i'm just going to move my microphone over there so i can get to my keyboard and uh let's go so i'm going to write three lines of computer code and then we'll talk about what it does we're going to type inductive uh, inductive number uh so this is this is this is a way of telling this computer proof system that we're about to define numbers uh, by by a collection of axioms. And the first axiom is that zero is a number. Uh, and the next axiom is that the successor of a number is a number. So I'm going to write it like this. S of, if N is a number, S of N is going to be a number. Uh, so I've, I've written it like that. And now I'm going to stop writing because that's the, that's it. Uh, that's that's it. So this looks a little bit intimidating, especially if you've never seen these things before. So let me let me write some comments. Comments are in green. Uh, and the first and most important comment is what does this colon mean? The colon, the colon, this thing here means is uh, is a. So this 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 computer proof system, the colon is an inbuilt thing. It's, it doesn't mean what you know, the colon, the use of the colon in English grammar. The colon in this type theory system uh, means the words the words is a. So inductive number means let's define numbers there. Uh, and this first line here, zero number, uh, that means zero is a number. There. We're postulating that as a definition. And uh, and then this thing here, this is a, this is an issue with word order. This says if n is a number. Uh, then s of n, uh, then s of n is a number. But the computers, you know, different languages have different word orders for things. So, uh, you know, this is the successor of the successor function of oh n, which is a number, is a number. You see, so that's uh, uh, and and of course the, now the definition n. So that's it. Uh, there. So that's what the, that's what the end of the file means. That that's it. So there's our definition of a number, and this is you know, a faithful, a faithful translation of uh, Piano's axioms. And so now the next, the next question I want to talk about is uh, what numbers can we make now? Uh, and of course we can make zero because uh, we have we have zero. You know we've postulated that zero is a number. So now we're in some abstract mathematical universe right now, and now I want to move into a subspace of that universe uh, consisting of you know the, the place where you know the place where number is defined i want to move straight to the place where number is defined uh, so let's do this we'll move into the number named space which is a uh, which is you know the part of the system where numbers are defined and now within this namespace we can do things like we, we can check zero there we, we we type check zero here i'll make this thing a bit larger we can type check zero here and, the, and we get some output here. Before, before there was no output here. It said no info find. If we check zero, we get an output. We get a little group message in green uh, there saying zero colon number. So this says zero is a number. So this check command says, what is zero? And it says zero is a number. And we can also check S. Uh, we can check S. And it says that S is a, it says that S is, S is a something else. S isn't a number. S is something with an arrow in. And what's happening here is that this is a function. Uh, this says that S is a function, and the input of the function is a number, and the output of the function is a number. So maybe we remember from school, what is a function? A function, the idea is, a function is the idea, it takes something in and it takes something out. Some of the buttons on your calculators, you know, these, these things, zero and S are buttons on your calculators, right? You, there's a button on your calculator that squares a number, and, uh, and there are other buttons on your calculator. There's a button that marks three, uh, which you know, which which produces three. But there's also a button marked log, you know, which takes the logarithm of the number on the screen. Uh, and so S is really a function like this. S S takes a number as input and uh, produces a number as output. And if you'd rather think of S as a function, uh, we could we could in fact just put that there if you like. We could replace. Uh, I've, I've lost the colon. Uh, we can say that S uh, S is a function from numbers to numbers. Uh, so that's what Lean internally thinks of as S. And so now let's make some numbers. Remember the idea is this S, uh, S, Lean doesn't have any kind of concept 
of adding one right now, right? Uh, what, we're, what we're doing here, how do, you, how do you teach numbers? I'm not talking about how we teach numbers at school. How do you teach numbers to a, to a, a two or three year old, you know, a, 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 a preschool child? And the way you begin to teach numbers to, numbers to a preschooler is you teach counting. You go, we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And, you know, you count and count and count. And eventually the child gets the idea that, you know, this, this primitive concept of this idea that given a number, there's always another number later. And later on, you know, you can you can count, you can start counting things, but the child begins to learn. You know, it's like a nursery rhyme: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's some kind of poem: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. It's a poem written in a very strange meter. It's written in ten four time. Uh, but but this is a uh, this is the purpose of this s. It tells us the next word in the poem. So zero is a number. So let's make another number. Let's make a definition. Definition. Let's define one. One is defined to be uh, the number after zero. So there we go. You see, we we feed in, uh, we feed in zero into the successor function, uh, and we get a new number out. Zero, we feed. You see, this is standard mathematical notation for a function. Uh, the function has some brackets around it, and zero we feed it into the function. And uh, we get another number out, and the number out, the, as far as Lean is concerned, the number out is just s of zero. Uh, but we'll give it a name, we'll call it one, and now we can check one. Now we have a new number, you see. Another number has been born. And uh, Lean, Lean informs us that one is a number. And we can, of course, continue, right? Let's make a few more. Let's define two. Def is just short for definition. Let's define two to be the number after one. Uh, let's define three to be the number after two. Uh, and let's define four to be the number after three, you see. And so what's going on here is we have this, you know, we have this lab, this computer program, but numbers aren't there. We're now making the numbers, you see. And, and I, can, I can prove to you that numbers aren't there. Let's, let's try and exactly, you know, let's check four. Uh, four, so these are out, but it says that four is a number. So for sure, four is a number. But uh, let's do an example. Let's check that two add two is four. This is a computer proof system after all. Uh, let's prove that two add two is four there. And, uh, and now we have, we have something different going on here. We were getting these nice little green, these nice little green messages informing us that one is a number. Uh, but now we, have a, now we have a red message here. So which, which means that something has gone wrong. And uh, what's, gone, what's gone wrong is that Linus failed to synthesize addition on numbers, we've used this addition symbol, but uh, you see, this is proof that these numbers these numbers aren't there before in the past, and uh, you know they've got they've got a, a whole bunch of you know machinery attached to them. Uh, we, we're trying to prove that two add two is four here, but at the minute we can't even state the fact uh, that two add two is four because because Lean doesn't know how to add numbers together. The only thing it can do with a number uh, is look at the number after. You see, so so this is numbers in a highly primitive state. Uh, you, you might think that addition is a primitive operation, but in fact, when you think about it, addition is something you learn at school. And before we learn to count, before we learn to add, we learn to count. So right now, we we all we have uh, is the ability to count. And and what I want to do next uh, in the next part of the talk is explain how we're going to go on from just the ability to count. Uh, how are we going to teach a computer the ability to add? Uh, so now I'm completely paranoid now I don't, that, that you can't you can't see. Oh, I can uh, just suddenly occur to me. I can check on the live stream. Uh, I can I can check on the live stream to see if uh, I'm not going to bother doing that. I'm assuming that you can now see my slides again. Uh, so that was us playing with axioms in the lab. And uh, now I want to talk a little bit about what actually happened under the hood, what actually happened you know, behind the scenes uh, when, we made, when we made that number. And uh, remember, we had three axioms. Uh, we, we defined a number with three axioms. So there's a number and there's three axioms. And those correspond to the four things that happen uh, when Lean sees what we typed in. Uh, so what are the four things happen? One, uh, the, the first thing that happens is that numbers, that the concept of number itself is born. That happens when you type that first line. Uh, 
So Lean makes a new type called number. If this was Lean is a type theory based uh, proof system. If we were using a set theory based proof system, uh, Lean would have created a new set uh, called number. But uh, I, I don't want to use these words like types and terms. So you know, sets have elements and types have terms. So the second line, and the second line of the code we typed in uh, was it was it was zero was a number. So it creates a new term called zero when we do this second line, and the and the type of zero is number. So you see, so yeah, you know, I'm not going to talk about terms. In, in fact, let's just let's forget that now. What's what's happening informally is that by line two of this three line definition. Uh, Lean knows that zero is a number. You see, this colon really, uh, the colon really means the thing on the left of the colon is a term, and the thing on the right of the colon is a type. And the colon means that the term is a term of that type. So if you're happy to think about numbers as a type and zero as a term of that type, that's fine. But we could just informally summarize that by saying zero is a number. So that's what's happened by the end of the second line. Lean has done two things. By the end of the third line, Lean has done three things. Lean has, Lean has created a function, uh, and this function eats a number in and spits a number out. And our mental model of this is that S is spitting out the number after the number we put in. But you see, we never actually said that, right? Lean's internal representation, uh, Lean's internal representation of three is, is, is S of S of S of zero. Right. It's, it's internal representation. It's just some sort of tree uh, which says it's S of something and the something is S of something and the something is S of something and the something is zero. So Lean doesn't know. You know Lean, Lean has this extremely autistic viewpoint of numbers. Uh, Lean doesn't really know that we're supposed to be thinking of numbers as somehow growing in size. Lean has no sort of concept uh, that three is bigger than zero or that three is, you know, some kind of meaningful way of talking about the three lines on the screen that that make the definition like this is completely abstracted away lean's concept of three at this point is you apply a function to a function you know you apply a function to a number which you obtained by applying a function to a number which you obtained by applying a function to a number which you obtained by using zero so lean has this function that given a number makes another number and it knows nothing about this function and then the fourth thing, which is in some sense is the most subtle thing, uh, which is Lean's interpretation of the fact that the definition has now ended. The definition of end, the definition has ended. And the fourth thing is Lean's interpretation of what that means. That's it. What happens when Lean realizes we've now gone on to something else? You know, when I when I typed check zero and def one, uh, when I started doing other things, Lean realized that the definition of number had ended. Uh, and so Lean has to have some kind of internal way of, uh, of understanding that this is the only way we have to make numbers. And that's the fourth, that's the fourth thing that appears you know, in Lean's system as, as, a, as an undefined constant. That's the fourth thing that appears when we finish our definition. And it's, it's really, when I understood fully what was going on, it's quite extraordinary because what we have here is a, a very, very reasonable, completely uncomprehensible definition of number uh, defined. You know, zero is a number, the number after a number is a number. But you think about what we can make, like the only way we can make numbers, you know, zero is the one we start with. And then the only other way we can make numbers is by applying this S function. So we apply it to zero, we get a new thing, we call it one. We apply it again, we get a new thing, we call it two. You know, th these are all the tools we have to make numbers. So you can see, that we're clearly making the natural numbers. Uh, and as I say, this is, this is a concept which really, you know, I think a small child uh, would be able to understand. You know, this is, this, is, this is the two ways you can make numbers. Zero is a number, the number after a number is a number. And now when you think about what you have, you have a very clear, you know, mental model for the number, you know, we're making the number line. We're, we'd, you know, the geometric picture is the number line, but this is the algebraic picture of the number line. Uh, so, but, but the problem is that's it isn't good enough uh, for this computer proof checker. We need to come up with some kind of formal, you know, I've, I've, I've shown, I can put, we can put check zero. We can see that zero is in the system and we can check S and we can see that S is in the system. But how, how, how do we actually see that that's it is in the system? So this is the last time I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, technical uh, computer science terms. Uh, but what we have now is we have a type called number 
and uh, we have we have two constructors for that type, which means we have two ways of making numbers. Zero is a number, and the number after a number is a number. And if you think about this abstractly, then that's not good enough. Any, given any new type, we don't just need constructors, we also need eliminators. And what an eliminator is, is a way of making other stuff, given that we have numbers. We need to, we need to have a way of making a function where the function takes in a number and it spits out something that isn't a number anymore, right? Because at the minute, at the minute, the tools I've shown you, the zero and the successor, we can go into the world of number, but we can't ever escape from it. If we have a number, the only thing we can do with it is apply the successor function and make another number. You see, we tried to add numbers together and it didn't work. We had an error that Lean didn't know what add was. So, you know, and I want, I might want to, if I'm a computer programmer, I might want to write a function that given a number outputs a list, you know, something like this. Or if I'm interested in proving mathematical theorems, I might, I might want to, you know, take in a number and output a true false statement, you know, a, a mathematical statement. For example, I, want, I might want to say that every number is either even or odd, or every number has a certain property. Uh, and so I need a way of, of taking in a number and outputting some kind of object that isn't a number. So we need eliminators. We need an eliminator for the number type. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the technical way of thinking about it. And now in more informal language, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it like this. The idea is we want to do something uh, with all numbers. We want, we want to do something with, with all numbers. And, uh, and what we need is a, is a way of guaranteeing that we've done something with all numbers. And here's the guarantee to do something with all numbers. This, this is the heart of that's it. To do something with all numbers, we've got to make sure uh, that we can do the following two things and then we're done, right? All you have to do to do something for all numbers is the following thing. First, you have to make sure you've done it for the first number, zero, because that's one way that numbers can be created. We can create numbers by saying zero is a number. And secondly, there's this successor way of creating numbers. So if we want to do something for all numbers, we'd better make sure that if we can do it for n, then we can do it for the number after n, right? We better make sure that we can do those two things for sure, uh, because, because that's the two ways that we can make numbers. But the point of that's it is that this is enough. If we want to do something with all numbers, then all we have to do is make sure we've done it for zero and make sure that if we know how to do it for n, then we know how to do it for the number after n. And if we've got those two ingredients, those two ingredients corresponding to the two ways we can make numbers, that's it means that's all we need to do. Those are the only ways we can make numbers. So if we can do it for zero and, and make sure that if we've done it for n, we can do it for the number after n, then we have a guarantee that we've done our thing for all numbers. And that's, that's how the computer understands that's it. And that's it comes, it comes up with a, a rather complex function called the recursor, that, which I won't show you. I'll show you in action. Uh, but I won't show you, you know, I won't show you what it actually looks like because it looks quite intimidating. But this is the summary of what I've just said. If we want to do something with numbers, then all we've got to do is make sure we've done it for zero and make sure that if we can do it for a number, then we can also do it for the number after. It's like a domino effect, right? Imagine numbers being all lined up as a bunch of dominoes. Then the idea is you put them near each other. That's doing, that's dealing with step two, making sure that if one falls over, the next one will fall over. And then all we've got to do with step one, we just want to knock over that first domino, make sure we do it for zero, and then all the dominoes fall over. So it's just the same with numbers. Uh, so now, you know, I'm still talking vaguely because I'm talking about this thing. What, what is this thing I'm trying to do with numbers? There's, two, mate, there's basically two things we want to do with numbers in a computer proof checker. Uh, the, and the two things, so I'll now separate, separate out the two things because the two things have different names mathematically. They turn out to be one thing in Lean. Uh, but these two things are two, are two different, math, mathematicians regard them as two different things. Firstly, we want to define functions. Like we want to define things like the Fibonacci sequence and things like this. Or you know, we, want to, we, we want to define a function that takes a number and, and spits out maybe a real number or more some, you know, some more exotic object that we've defined in our system. So if that thing is defining a function, then we call this the principle of recursion uh, for numbers. Uh, but the other possibility is the thing might be proving a theorem. Uh, and if the thing is proving a theorem, uh, then, then this is called the principle of induction for natural numbers. 
And I think what's very interesting here is that the principle of induction is something we teach to 17 and 18 year olds in the UK. So in, in particular, my daughter will never see, she'll never be taught the principle of induction at school because now she's done with mathematics. Uh, but my my, uh, my my two other kids, they both decided to do more mathematics. They did two more years of mathematics before they gave up on it. And uh, so both my other children did see uh, the principle of induction. But what's interesting is that we want to define addition, right? This is where we're going. We want to define addition. But my daughter certainly saw addition when she was you know, five years old. She saw this in primary school. And what's going on here is there's this subtle switch, right? When we teach children to count, we're, we're using this ordinal nature of numbers. You know, this one of the talks yesterday we saw, we saw, you know, which came first, the ordinals or the cardinals? And, and maybe one can argue that the ordinals came first because we, we abstractly learned to start counting. But the moment we're at school, this cardinal viewpoint is, is thrust upon us. How do we work out that two add two is four? The, the way we work this out is we, you know, we're sitting at our desk and the teacher comes around and gives us a whole load of plastic, you know, plastic uh, cubes, let's say. And the idea is you put two cubes in one hand and you put two cubes in the other hand and the left hand cube has two and the right hand cube has two. And then you put all the cubes together in a pile in front of you and then you count the cubes and you count the cubes and there's four cubes, right? So this is a, but you're using, you're using cardinals uh, to define cubes. You're, you're thinking about two as two of something, right? Uh, so addition is not the thing that's, you know, it's, addition is the thing that's born next after the number line uh, in a child's education. But the principles of induction and recursion, these are the things which are born next in lean. And I've, I've tried to indicate that although they sound sort of sophisticated, where, where if you actually look at the definition of number, you can see that the principle of induction, and the principle of recursion just follow immediately on from that definition of number. They are. That's sort of a very natural thing. So let's teach the computer addition. I have 10 minutes to go. Let's teach the computer addition. So the, and the problem is we can't use, can't, the problem with the way my daughter was taught addition, she was taught that two out two is four by, show, by, by being shown that, you know, two apples add two apples is four apples because you have two apples here, two apples there, you count the apples. But the, but the problem with that approach is, is that you haven't proved that two out two is four. You proved that two apples add two apples is four apples. Yeah, and you know, if you've never seen an elephant, how do you actually know that two elephants add two elephants is going to equal four elephants from, from this, this cardinal based approach? You don't know. Now, Lean has neither seen apples nor elephants, so we need to come up with something else, you see. Uh, and, and, and so this is how we're going to use induction. Let's, let's, let's figure out how we're going to do two, two add a number. Uh, and let's use this principle of recursion to add two to a number. So by this principle of mathematical recursion, we want to figure out how to add two to any number at all. This is what we want to do. Uh, so we've got to, we, by the principle of recursion, all we have to do is the following two things. Firstly, we need to decide on what two add zero is going to be, right? We need to come up with an idea for two add zero. And secondly, we need to make sure that if we can do two add X, then we can do two add the number after x. You know, so here's a tricky example. Let's say we know that two add x is 91. We need to figure out what two add the number after x is going to be. And uh, of course, two add the number after x. Well, we can, you know, if you like, we can work it out completely. If two add x is 91, then x is 89. Uh, so the number after x is 90, and two add the number after x is 92. But actually, if you think about it, we didn't need to go through that procedure. If two add x is 91, then two add the number up. We've got, we've got two and then we've got x and then we've got the number after x. So we've got one more. So two add the number after x is one more than two add x, you see. So if two add x is 91, I don't really care what x is. Two add the number after x is going to be 92. Uh, so let's, let's do this in lean now. Let's go back to our, let's go back to the lab and let's define addition. Let's, you see, we, we're, we're using it there. But uh, now I have to move my mic back over here. Uh, so let's define let's define addition. Let's define let's define add there. So that's going to be a function from numbers. It will take our first number, which will be two, and then when you think about it, it produces the adding two function. So we now need a second number two, and it's going to print out a third number. 
that's what our, our addition is going to look like. And uh, I did it with two. Let's do it with n. Uh, let's let's define n n add zero uh, n add zero. Let's define it to be n. That's a good like we have to. We, it's at this point here. We, you know, we could define n add zero to be thirty seven, right? We could define n add. Lean doesn't care, right? We could define n add zero to be four, uh, but let's not do that. Let's define n add zero to be n, and let's define n add the number after x. Uh, let's define it to be uh, the number after what we get when we add n to x. There. Add n to x. Remember them. So th there's my definition of add. So this says you, and. You see, the, the, the fact that this has worked means that Lean must somehow secretly know that to define addition on all numbers, all we have to do is say what n add zero is and say what n add the number after x is. So there's our definition of addition. And this still hasn't worked because, uh, because we didn't define plus. So now, now we could put add two, two is four. There, you see, now, now, now Lean is happier. Lean's happier with this idea now. Now we don't have a red, now we don't have a red, uh, problem over here we have an orange problem. we have an amber problem saying this amber problem says yeah well it's all well and good you claiming that two add two is four uh but you uh, how do we know it's true you see we can check uh, we can check add two two let, let, let me do let me do the plus uh let me define the notation uh instance has add number uh add there i i've told so there we go so now we can now we can use our normal notation to add two there. Two add two is four. You see, we can. What is two add two? Uh, we can ask. We can ask Lean what it thinks two add two is, and you see, it's happened. Oh, two add two is a number. You see, we can we can ask it what four is, and it, it say, oh, four is a number as well. You see, and so so this is this is different. Like claiming that two add two is four. Uh, you see, right now Lean knows Lean knows that all these things are numbers, but how are we actually going to make Lean start thinking? You know, start manipulating the numbers. So this is somehow, you know, the first interesting question. We've told it numbers, we've told it addition, and now can it can it prove that two add two is four? So proving that two add two is four is actually quite a tricky. Uh, it's actually quite a tricky. <laughs> it's actually quite tricky. So here's the reminder: what we have. So zero is a number. One's the number after zero. Two's the number after one. Three's the number after two. Four's the number after three. And uh, the definition of addition, we're defining two add zero to be two, and we're defining two add the number after n to be the number after two add n. And now the question is, can we work out what two add two is? So here we go. Let's go. Let's let's have a go. You see, this is the, these bullet points above here. These are the only things that Lean knows, right? It doesn't have any kind of feeling as to what numbers are. These are the only things that Lean knows. And so now let's go as humans. Let's try and figure out how to prove that two add two is four. So what's two add two? What does that mean? Well, Lee knows what two add the number after something is, and, and two is the number after one. So two add two is two add the number after one by, by definition of two. You see, we're in a very strange state. We don't normally see maths in this state here. We've got a few numbers defined. We've got addition defined, but uh, you know, but we to, to actually do things with addition, we're gonna have to work this stuff out ourselves. You know, we haven't done things like column addition. And we're in a very primitive state here. So two add two is two add the number after one. So by definition, that's the number after two add one. There. So and th now you see that you can see this is progress because two add one is a simpler problem than two add two. So two add two is the number after two add one. And what's one? One is the number after zero. So, so this reduces the problem really to working out what two add the number after zero is. Uh, and two add the number after zero, of course, that's the number after two add zero. So now we've reduced the problem to working out what two add zero is really. And two add zero, that's okay. Two add zero has been defined to be two. So by definition of addition, two add zero is two. Uh, and so now we know that two add two is the number after the number after two. And uh, we, can we can continue the computation, you see, because the number, af the number after two is three. And that's by the definition of three, right? That's not sort of that's not sort of obvious or something you can prove by counting. That's the actual definition of three, and the number after three is four. And so this very long calculation here, and you, you, we could have taken look, we could have taken wrong turns here, right? There's, this is somehow a little maze. Uh, so we found our way through the maze. I, I, I give I, I give talks related to this in schools. 
and I get school kids to prove that two add two is four. And when you let them do it, if you if you, you give the talk on the whiteboard, then you can run through it. And, and some people go the wrong way. Like that first two never changed. You can change that first two to the number after one. And uh, you can somehow go down a wrong path and then you have to backtrack later. So what we did here was we made our way through a maze. And, you know, the prize at the end of the maze was that two add two is four. QED, you see, that's a, that's a, that's a proof that two add two is four. Uh, and now we can go back to lean. And of course we can type in that same thing into lean. And, it, and if that was what we did, if that was what I did next, I then went on and, and typed in the same thing into lean. In some sense, the experiment would be a failure because what we want to do is we want the system to be able to find its way through the maze itself. And, and the system can do it. So here we go. If I do this, there, the, the orange lines go away now. Uh, and we have no errors at all. I, I typed in a three letter command that ran, this ran a good old fashioned AI. It ran, a, it, this, this command ran a little AI and this little AI found its way through the maze automatically. You see, all we did was we taught the computer the definition of two and we taught the computer the definition of four and we taught the computer the definition of addition, but now it's managed to do you see, this is not what a calculator does. A calculator knows two add two is four because you've taught it the algorithm to add numbers. If you ask it to add two add two, it says, oh yeah, I have a method for doing that. You see here, here we didn't teach a computer a method. We didn't teach it column addition or anything like that. All we did was we taught it the definition of addition. And we said, you take it from there, computer proof system. And the computer proof system comes up with a method for adding numbers together. And it applies the method to two add two and it observes that it comes out with the number four. So it's not thinking, but it's it's finding its way through mazes very quickly. That's what's going on. Uh, and so, so one can go on and say, well, you know, what, what's the point of this, right? Because we understand, we understand natural numbers and we have calculators to do two add two, but there's other kinds of numbers that mathematicians deal with as well. You know, for example, this cardinal definition of numbers, we can look at all types and we can say two types are equivalent if there's a function that matches up one with the other. And then we could define numbers that we could define cardinal numbers as equivalence classes of these, uh, of, the, of these types. And we could define addition on cardinals. And again, we could try and prove that two add two is four there. Or we could try and see if we can get the, see if the computer can prove it itself. Or we could define real numbers as dedicating cuts or equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. And uh, because as long as we have a, a rigorous abstract definition, and this is exactly the kind of thing that pure mathematicians do, they come up with rigorous abstract definitions of all the objects they work with. And as long as you have such a definition as we have in pure mathematics, you know, for all the things we use, uh, one can make that definition in this lab and move away from the blackboard and the PDF and start using the computer proof system instead. So for example, Conway defines surreal numbers Conway defines a game uh, to, be, to be the moves that left can make and the moves that right can make. He defines it recursively, the definition of a game. The idea is a game is a collection of games that the, you know, the first player can move to and then another collection of games the second player can move to. Even if you think of a game as a position. And uh, this is Conway's definition of game. And you might think, well, this is not going anywhere because he's defined a game, but it involves a pair of sets of games. But the trick is, of course, you can have the empty set of games before you've made any games at all. And then Conway defines zero to be the game where neither left nor right can make a move. Left and right, the player one and player two. Conway defines zero to be the game uh, where neither player can make a move. And he defines one to be the game where left can make one move to the zero game and right can't make any moves at all. And he can go on there. You see, you can imagine this is just the same sort of story. We could do this in Lean. And indeed, it has been done in Lean. Uh, so you can make games like this, and then he defines a number to be a certain kind of game, a game that looks a bit like a, a, a Dedekind sum. And uh, Lean has got a, you know, these are Conway's so-called surreal numbers. And again, you can just type in Conway's definition into Lean and make these numbers too. So we can make all these kinds of numbers, but furthermore, we can make all the kinds of tools that mathematicians use to manipulate these numbers. You know, Fermat's last theorem was proved in the 1990s, this is a very simple statement about natural numbers, uh, but the, it took 350 years to prove. And uh, you know, the, the proof involved much more complex objects like elliptic curves and modular forms and Galois representations. And one can make these objects in lean as well because we have a precise definition of these things. And all you need is a precise definition. 
uh, and you can make these objects. So this is my last slide. And, uh, and, and the question is, what's the point of making these objects? You see, because there's a perfectly good way of making them. You can write, you can write the definition down on a blackboard or in a PDF, you know, or in a math, in a maths book. And, uh, and then you know you can you can use these you know you can give their books to other people and uh, they can read your books and they can understand your ideas. We have a perfectly good way of communicating mathematics. Uh, but Lean's maths right? Math mathematicians find it quite good fun. I mean, I, d I don't know if this came across, but I actually find it a whole lot of fun uh, making you know giving birth to numbers again and again like this. You know, I've I've done this many times now, and uh, and giving birth to many other mathematical objects as well. And other people have become interested, other mathematicians have become interested, and they've started making the kind of things they use in their research. So within four years, we've gone from no code to half a million lines of code. We have this gigantic maths library. And uh, we've been concentrating, for the most part, on the kind of things we teach a pure mathematician in an undergraduate degree, which is, you know, which can be broadly classed, you know, sort of analysis and algebra, analysis and algebra, you know, the discrete and the continuous. Uh, and so we have essentially all the algebra that they learn and we have maybe half the analysis, but give us another couple of years and we'll have all the analysis. And then you can argue at that point. And then by that point, the system we have and other systems are already essentially at this state. Uh, the system we have will be able to understand the questions that we ask the undergraduates in order to get them to graduate. Uh, it, you know, we'll be able to type the exam questions into the system. And the system will be able to say, yes, I understand that this is, you know, a question that can be worked on. Uh, and, you know, of course, another question is, can we train the computer to prove these things? I mean, I'll get to that. Actually, I lied. This is my last but one slide. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have half the analysis as an undergraduate degree, but we have all the algebra. And the algebraists, for example, me, uh, are interested in pushing things much further. So we now move to this kind of MSc level algebra and, and much more. You know, we have some modern research level algebra in these systems and, uh, and other theorem provers. They have other bits as well. You know, there's other theorem provers have much more analysis. For example, Isabel Hall has much more analysis. And there are some highly non-trivial pieces of algebra in the system COC. So, uh, you know, these, these, are, these are really the three main systems for, uh, for sort of serious modern mathematics. So sorry, this is my last slide. Uh, really, I'll, yeah, I just want to finish by saying, what's the point of training a computer to do mathematics? Well, the, fir the first thing is they're more accurate than humans. You know, there's plenty of mistakes in the mathematical literature, but there's no mistakes in our half a million lines of maths library. Uh, because, I mean, for technical reasons, but one can, one can check, you know, one can get independent systems to verify that our system is correct. So th these things are much more accurate than e independently. They're much more accurate than humans, basically, because they they don't you know we don't see them as making mistakes, whereas humans make mistakes everywhere. But they're also more autistic. They're less capable of thinking for themselves. They have some primitive AIs, but uh, they're not they're not quite there yet doing their own research. But I can imagine using them for, for undergraduate and also sort of PhD level teaching. You know, once they once they become large databases of known facts then you can start querying these databases and uh, and asking what is known you know is this is this theorem known uh, and you you might get an answer yes it's known and furthermore it's in my database or you might get an answer yes this has been claimed by humans and the reference is this paper here so if you start you know telling it the things that we believe uh, then you can start getting very you know once it knows all the once it knows all the definitions we know you can start stating the theorems we know and uh, and not proving them, and then we'll, you know, envisage rather rapid progress. But of course, what we ideally want to get these systems to is the point where they start proving mathematical theorems on their own. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but one of the reasons it hasn't happened is that some some AIs like to be trained on a database, and it's only recently that these databases have started getting very large and becoming somehow appropriate for these kinds of questions. So will they start proving theorems on their own? I mean, some computer scientists are absolutely convinced that this is the future of mathematics and uh, that people like me, pure mathematicians, are going to be out of a job soon because, you know, the thing we add our art, uh, you know, the, the idea of, you know, trying to prove a theorem by going in a certain direction or trying to prove a theorem by creating a certain new tool, uh, 
people people are arguing that computers will be able to start learning to make these tools automatically and learning to prove theorems automatically and uh, and if that happened i mean people worry about computers you know putting vast vast um, vast members you know huge numbers of members of the population out of a job but actually i think that if i'm working on this kind of thing i might end up in some sense putting myself out of a job but one one would find it very hard to argue that this isn't some kind of progress uh, because then computers and humans will be able to start working together uh, to push mathematics further. Uh, so that's that's the end of that. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll, I'll finish by saying uh, and thank you very much to, to, to Carlos and Laura for uh, organising such a wonderful conference. Uh, thank you to both of you and, and thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for a great presentation. It was very engaging, very well communicated. Um, let me see. Oh, okay. We already have some hands in the air now. Um, Andrea, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Kevin. That was really nice. Um, I have just a, a couple of general comments. And, and uh, of course, this really much relates to what I was talking uh, uh, about yesterday from a different perspective. And, 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 then, a, and then a question. Uh, well, the, the, the Two uh, comments is, uh, I mean, um, it's nice to show that uh, computers are proving that Leibniz was right. Uh, <laughs> actually, the, the basic idea of defining numbers in terms of their predecessors, and so in the, the, the basic idea that underlies the recursive definition of natural number and the idea that when you have even complex addition, you can just uh, go back in the chain of 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 uh, successors and and go back uh, go back to one it was actually initially um suggested by leibniz and then it was oh. uh, taken back by uh by Frege and then as you said by person and that so and, century uh, before centuries and, before yes 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 was okay. uh, it was uh, it was leibniz that actually when Frege criticizes several he criticizes the notion of number by Newton, by Euclid, and by Kant, by Mill, and so on. Uh, the only one that he doesn't criticize because he actually defines numbers in this way is Leibniz one. He takes Leibniz to have uh, gotten to the very nature of the idea that uh, each number must be defined by its predecessor up to zero, back to zero. And, and so that, that is where all these ideas uh, then, then come from in, 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 in the history of philosophy, but I guess also mathematics. Uh, so that, that's very nice to, 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 to see that is the same idea that underlies um, uh, computer proofs and, and, and this, kind, this kind of systems. Um, uh, the second one, you, you said something really, um, uh, I think really correct. And then that is another connection with what I was talking about, sorry, talking about Frege all the time, but um, um, at a certain point you said, how, how can we know that um, if we know that two plus two equals four, and then we have two elements, uh, two elephants, and we put together other two elephants, how do we know that the result is four elephants? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's totally correct, and indeed, uh, the idea, uh, and and that that is just a connection you might find interesting. It's the idea of Frege exactly for solving this problem. Problem was to think that when you use numbers, uh, you are not saying anything about things; you are saying something about concepts. So, for example, if you say there are two moons of Mars. Uh, you're not talking about the properties of the moons of Mars. You are saying something about the concept being a moon of Mars, and you're saying that it, it has two elements, it, it is equinumerous with my ends, and so on. So actually, the problem that you raise is exactly the same problem. I cannot count things if I do not uh, antecedently possess a sharp concept under which those things uh, can, uh, can, can fall. And actually, the, the idea of defining pure mathematics in this way would be something like, if I have two elements falling under the concept and two elements falling under the same concept, then I get four elements falling under the, the same concept. But <laughs> before that, I, of course, I have to have the concept as, as, you, were, as you were saying. And here, if I can, as a small question. Um, uh, you said something that was uh, really interesting to me. You said at a certain point, you, we kind of feel that the basic um, uh, idea 
uh, I mean, but the, the basic conception of number is the ordinal one, but then um, when I uh, ordinally count and I get to a certain, uh, certain number of things, then I have to apply uh, the number to those things, and that is a cardinal use. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, if I, I mean, uh, I'm talking loosely, I'm not, I'm, but, but uh, it's more or less. Sure. Uh, I was wondering whether the system is really uh, counting and in what sense it, it is counting. Because, <laughs> um, uh, of course, at a certain point, you, you, you want to say that, in, uh, that you have five fingers, okay? Uh, you want to count the fingers. And there is a sense in which you can just say that's the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. But that's the ordinal way. And then you want the cardinal way. You want to say there is uh, number five fingers here. There are, how many are they? They are five. Can, can um, I do it like this? Is this... Uh, can I... Is this... Is this uh, I want to make them like this. Sorry, we... we you're, not sharing if you are sharing your screen, you are not. <laughs> uh, I I'm so. There we go. No, but but, but the idea is the, the basic. Yeah, I, I'm defining I'm defining like this, like middle, so index. I I want to I want to define. I mean, I'm not using numbers at all here, right? Okay. There. Yeah, well, middle finger is a nice line of code. Uh, there and then little fingers. So now, now I've defined a new object in this theorem proof called fingers. And there's no, I mean, we can see on the left here, we can see that there's, it took five lines to define it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there's no, there's no numbers at all here. And, and now I can ask, and now I can ask myself which number corresponds to fingers, right? But now I actually have to do something. Yeah, right now, I, now I'm gonna have to prove a theorem that says that this kind of fingers is somehow corresponding to, I never defined five, right? Five, yeah. uh, the number after four. But but now we're gonna have to do some work to prove that this this and number I mean, five and yeah. these and these fingers are in some way related. But, but that work can be done. Uh, I would just need to import some more. I mean, I'm not gonna sit and do live coding. No, 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 I was wondering <laughs> whether this is a, sorry, and then I'm, I'm taking too much time, but I was wondering whether this is a really a cardinal use. Because actually, what the system is doing is uh, associating a one in you know, a one-to-one -one correspondence the number of numbers to the number of things, and yeah. of course, this is a cardinal use. But be, before doing that, you need to know in which order are the sit, the numbers that you are associating with the objects. So you need them to be placed in a given order. So ah, no, order because I can prove I can prove a theorem that says that they can be put in any order, and there'll still be five of them. Right. That's, that's a theorem I can prove in the system. <laughs> so I, I don't need to order them, but I do need to, you're absolutely right. If I, if I had to prove some kind of relation, I can, I can formalize a relation between this five and these fingers. Mm -hmm. And the way I would formalize that represent, I would, I would, I would import, I would, I would import cardinal. That's the, be the first thing I would do there. I would import, I, I forgot what it's called. Set theory, set theory, there it is. Yeah, that would be the first. So now I have a theory of cardinals, and now I can use that theory of cardinals to relate fingers to five, and and that's exactly what I do. I would make, I, I I would I would find some, I would create some abstract set with five elements. It would be the set zero, one, two, three, four, and then I would prove that there existed some one-to-one -one correspondence between that and the fingers. So there would be bijections of functions, mm -hmm. and the whole all that concept of cardinality would be there. Yes, I I, I can't. I can't see how to do that without introducing some concept of cardinality. So it happens very early on. Sure. Cardinality. Okay. Okay. But, Thanks. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. It's it's there, and furthermore, if you want to do anything, it, it's necessary. It, it was yeah very very early on we developed a theory of cardinals. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, um, Andrea and Kevin. Um, Kieran. Uh, you raise your hand in the comments. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing yeah. your name right. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, hi, Kevin. Uh, hi. Thank you for this great talk. I'm delighted to see you continuing to uh, bring interactive theorem proving into the kind of mathematical mainstream. Uh, I've been following for quite a while and it's uh, nice to learn about lean. Um, but I'm working on the kind of set theory side of this. So uh, I apologize for any bias in my uh, That's my fine. Class. 
Um, Takes all sorts. <laughs> so we can see Lean's type theory as a kind of tool for interfacing with this mathematical universe that you talked about, um, math, the, the one that mathematicians interact with and talk about on blackboards and within PDFs and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, obviously, the way that we do this within Lean and within type theory is very different to how we do it on paper, uh, which is, you know, we would we would generally use sets of things and you know our uh, numbers and and stuff like that aren't inductive data types and and, and this that and the other the, uh, the, the, uh, you i i object to this claim that it would be very different in fact it would be almost exactly the same until you get down to this very primitive level yeah okay so th this is this is what my question is is getting at i suppose um so as somebody who's experienced with, with both of these kinds of uh, interfaces, you know, you, I assume you, you're a pure mathematician beforehand, so you've done lots and lots of work on paper and on PDFs and with talking to other people. Uh, yeah. So this very kind of I now reject organic all of kind of mathematics. <laughs> and now yeah. you've been uh, really pioneering this, this lean stuff and working with undergraduate students and stuff like that. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but do you find that, you know, like once you've got all of this stuff set up and you've done these initial definitions and done the kind of groundwork, perhaps the machine code, um, do you find that there are kind of how, how easy is it, you know, to, to prove all of these things? Do you run into any situations where the types are giving you grief and, and making things harder to do than, than you would like to just do them on paper or you would like to just tell someone about them? I mean, obviously the types give us lots and lots of great stuff as well. Like they allow you to, to do all of this computation as well. But yeah. So yeah, the answer is, so to, to respond to, to your first comment, I think that mathematic mathematicians do mathematics using some kind of language of mathematics yeah. that isn't necessarily set theory or type theory. I mean, people like Gauss and Euler were doing mathematics before set theory and type theory existed and they were unquestionably, you know, proving theorems. And I was brought up to believe that I was doing mathematics within set theory uh, be because I thought that, you know, that's, that was the only foundation I knew. And when I was a PhD student, I would think, oh, look, I, can do all, I know how to do all of this within, the, you know, the, the language of set theory. And then when I realized I was going to have to learn type theory, I was kind of horrified uh, because I thought I'm going to have to sort of figure out how everything works again. And in, in particular, the definition of the natural numbers is completely different. Uh, but then it turns out that the, de the definition of everything else beyond that is just the same, you know, like rationals are you know, the field of fractions of the integers and real numbers are equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rationals. So that put me much more at ease that I realized that th this, this sort of machine, this very foundational machinery, when I go on about types and things, is actually only ever happening at the very bottom. And then after that, you know, one can start treating math mathematical objects uh, the way the way one normally treats them and I spent some time sort of believing that this wasn't an issue at all and you know at that time the answer to your question would have been no type theory does it all fine and type theory set theory all the same thing but as, as I've been going on I you know I've been I've been trying to push this you know I somehow I had some kind of midlife crisis a few years ago and I started really kind of doubting you know whether any of my own papers were actually valid uh, because that hadn't been sort of formally checked by computers. And I was, I was beginning to realize that, you know, humans uh, were sometimes not accurate. So I started pushing these systems to kind of try and do the, you know, the kind of mathematics I do in my research. And when you do that, you do absolutely run into issues uh, where, where, where things would be much easier if we were in set theory. And I genuinely don't know whether these issues are there because we haven't quite found the right abstractions or whether they are there uh, because sometimes sometimes it's absolutely clear to me that mathematicians are doing mathematics in, in a way that fits very well into type theory. And in set theory, you'd have to jump through a whole lot of ho hoops. And in type theory, it's very natural. But conversely, there are times where mathem math mathematicians are doing things which fit very naturally into set theory and when you're doing things type theoretically, uh, you have to start jumping through hoops. And, the, and the, example, the example I have is when you have one big structure and two smaller structures. This was the first example I ran into. 
you have a large set C and then a subset B and a subset A. Mm. Uh, so, for example, you know, C in, in the actual instance when I ran, ran in, I was proving results in a Tia McDonald about commutative rings. And uh, C was a large ring and B was a subring of C mm -hmm. and A was a subring of B. And we have a theory of subrings, but a subring of a type is a term. And then we also have an abstract theory of maps between rings and maps between rings and maps between types. You know, type set theory has just one object, the set, right? And so in some sense, you can see that type theory is in some sense a more refined idea because type theory has two things, the type and the term. But now, of course, then you run into examples where suddenly you want, you know, half the time you want this thing to be a type and half the time you want this thing to be a term. You see, mm -hmm. most things, most things, there is a, things like pi, right? For, for a set theory, is pi is a set. For a type theory, is pi is a term because I don't ever want to know what the elements of pi are. That's not a mathematical question. In, you know, for, for a set theorist, the real numbers are a set. For the type theorist, the real numbers are a type because, they, you know, they're a collection of terms. And so that's great for real numbers. But what about if I've got three rings A, B, and C, and B is a subring of C, and, and A is a subring of B, and A is also a subring of C, right? And A is a B, al you know, B is an A algebra, and C is an A algebra. And, and the theory of algebras is set up with types, and the theory of subrings is set up with terms. And it's it's sort of, I've got a term that says that A is a subring of B, and I've got a different term that says that A is a subring of C. And all of a sudden you're thinking, actually, wouldn't it be great if all these things were just sets? Because then you've got sets and subsets, and that's it. Uh, and when we ran into this, we in some sense, we got stuck. Uh, and I asked around as to how these solutions, how these questions were solved in other theorem provers, but it turns out that sort of MSC level algebra is not something that in the past people have really been concentrating on. Mm -hmm. And so it turned out the, these things hadn't been solved. And so we're solving these questions ourselves. And, and right now we have, you know, abstractions that will deal with this. You know, we have some sort of coercion that yeah. if it sees that A is a subring of B, it will actually make A into a type and make B into an A algebra. And if it sees that you know, we have something that's specific to the number three. If it sees that C is a B algebra and C is an A algebra and B is an A algebra, then all then all these things, you know, we want to say that all of these actions are consistent with each other. And we have an abstraction that says that, that works specifically for the number three. And you know, when we run into the number four, we might have to make a new abstraction or might have to you know, think about how our old abstraction can be used. But you do run into issues where things would be much easier in set theory but and set theory definitely has its own its own problems and its own issues. Yeah, set theory has its own problems. I, I completely agree with this position that what mathematicians are doing on paper is is neither set theory yes. or type theory. These are both just approximations that are trying to grasp at <laughs> something yes. that's completely extraordinary. I, I, when a mathematician is drawing pictures of tori, when a mathematician is removing a little disc from a from a torus and then gluing in and then gluing in another torus. This is neither set theory nor type theory. This is a this is mathemat this is Euclidean. This is mathematics by you know some huge extension of Euclid's concept of a picture. But thank uh, you very much for uh, elaborating on on these issues of type theory. It's very interesting. I have heard uh, that all, all of these complaints do always seem to center around um, these algebraic structures and and having sub sub structures kind of thing. And I I, I wonder where those issues stem from, but. Thank yeah. you. But, um, but what, what I what I don't know is how to do pictures because yeah. we've done nothing. Yeah, when you do proofs by there's a beautiful book called sort of proofs, you know, proofs without words, mm -hmm. and you read through this book and you see all these pictures and you kind of think, yeah, that's a proof. I I I would write that proof on the whiteboard. I would draw that picture on the whiteboard. But how one translates that into either set theory or type theory, mm -hmm. you know, this is sort of a very interesting question. It's one that we've only just begun. We only we've only just begun to work on it. We're we're beginning to translate you know, Olymp maths Olympiad geometry questions into lean. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's been thousands of lines of code yet. And right now we can start talking about triangles and angles and pictures, but we only have the most primitive way of manipulating them. Perhaps we can see uh, pictures as kind of abstract objects which live in some sort of space, but there are many different representations that they can have, e.g. existing uh, as pixels on a, on a screen or... Uh, some kind of yes. three-dimensional space, and then we can maybe start to make sense of what these things mean. Who knows? <laughs> so then, yeah, the problem is different. You can have different pictures of the same thing. So then you have to deal with the fact, 
you know, some concept of equivalence. Yeah, equivalence classes of, <laughs> but I'm taking up too much time. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Yeah, cheers. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, you're next. Yes, uh, very briefly, now that you're still sharing your screen, um, can we see the proof that Lin did for 2 plus 2 equals 4? Uh, the, um, the, the, yeah, uh, it's, it's true by definition. Lean unraveled the definitions. It unfolded two, it unfolded one, uh, it unfolded four. Uh, oh, it curses to, un I should unfold four and then unfold three, shouldn't I? Uh, there. So there you go. First, it unraveled all the definitions. And so it could see, you know, this is the successor of the successor of zero plus the successor of the successor of zero. And then we should unfold, uh, we should unfold addition as well. And then unfold, uh, ha ha ha. No, now I'm struggling. I, it's, I think, Oh, I could do the, I could do it like this. Uh, change zero. Uh, what do it, it would be change s of zero dot s dot s plus zero dot s. It, it found the same. It found the same. I showed you the proof that it found uh, equals something there. And uh, yeah, yeah. It 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 keeps follow. It keeps following its nose, and eventually. Uh, Eventually, when it, when it, un, it unravels everything, and uh, eventually, when it's unraveled everything, it, it, it realizes it's faced with this. Yeah, yeah. I just meant it at a, a sort of a user level. If I were to to know the proof for a theorem, oh, so we could give it, it, it. No, it, it will just tell you that it's true by definition. Okay. Uh, def, you know, profound theorem. There we go. We can define it to be a profound theorem that two add two is four. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll I'll replace the proof. There. And now we can now we can do print uh, print profound theorem, and uh, yeah, it says it's it says the the it says the proof is that uh, uh, the proof is that two add two is equal to two. Yeah, it, it says it's it's true by definition of equality. I mean, one has to look at yeah, it, it's applied the function ek dot refl to two add two. So now how, one has to look at the definition of ek dot refl. Uh, because this is the function it used, and uh, there's the definition of ek dot refl. So it it used this function here, the equality function, which is defined by saying x is equal to x, and that's it. <laughs> that's how Lean defines equality. Right. And uh, and so then for that for that to apply, it has to check that. The, the dip, when you unravel everything, the definitions of two plus two and four are the same. And so it does this automatically. Right. It, it evaluates both of them in terms of the primitive notions it has. And it discovers that they're both, is it, you know, it discovers that they're both the same. But, but as I say, it, it doesn't tell you that. But that's what this says to me. It says, I evaluated, I evaluated both sides in terms of the primitive definitions that you put into me when, when you defined number. And I verified that when expressed in terms of the primitive definitions, they were both literally the same. So, so I was just wondering, is this, I mean, this doesn't sound super useful for a, for a mathematician who is willing to learn the steps of the proof. It's obviously super useful to know the, the statements are true, but if you actually want to know all the steps of a particular proof, this as a Ah, oh, yeah, if the, if the computer finds the proof, then sometimes it can be difficult to figure out what the computer did. Right, yeah, that's, that was my point, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, look, I'll show you, here, here's sort of, let me show you an interesting example. Let me import, let me import some numbers. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get, let's find, let's get a new file. <laughs> it, let me, let me show you an example of a, oh, that's me doing rehearsal. Uh, let me import a tactic. Let me show you an example of a of a of a proof. Let's prove that x add y squared example. Let's have x. Let's have a real numbers import. Uh, let me show you something scary. So x and y are real numbers. Uh, let's prove that. Uh, 
let's prove that uh, x add y squared is what you think it is. x add y squared equals x squared uh, plus 2 times x times y plus y squared. Uh, and there's a little, there we go. So there's a little AI that does that for us, a little good old fashioned AI, the ring, the ring tactic. And now let's do what we did before. Let's define, you know, let's define whatever, foo. That's a good, that's what mathematicians call things. And now let's print foo. So if you ask, if you ask a student, you know, to, to prove that x add y squared is x squared add 2x, y add y squared, you know, if you said, show me your working, they would expand out the brackets and do things carefully. But if you ask Lean to show you it's working, it's just absolutely incomprehensible. <laughs> so there's, there's Lean's proof that x add y all squared is x squared add 2x, y add y squared. And, th and this means nothing to anyone. Yeah, yeah. That, that was exactly my point. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, of course, if it gets... So if it gets to the point, which some people think it will, where computers are proving theorems, uh, you, you might... I mean, if a computer announces a proof of the Goldback conjecture, then we might be... It'll be like Apple and Harkin. To Apple and Harkin proved this, uh, this four-color theorem, this four-color conjecture in the 1970s, and their proof used a computer, and there was kind of an outcry in the mathematical community because a proof is supposed to give you some sort of insight as to why it's true. And the Apple and Harkin proof, the insight it gave was, well, we, re we realized that actually if you just checked it for 2,000 graphs, then you could deduce it for all other graphs by induction. And then we just checked it for 2,000 graphs by brute force. Mm. And we might have Apple and Harkin too one day where a computer says, I've proved the Goldback conjecture. And you say, how do you do it? It's a, it's a billion lines of code, but you can verify that this code, you can verify that this is a proof from the axioms. Mm. And, uh, and that's all I can tell you, really, you puny human. <laughs> and... and and, and I, I'm, I'm rather hoping that this will happen one day in my lifetime because it will cause, it will upset a great deal of people. And, you know, I like to cause trouble. Yeah, that's you know? exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. Very exciting. I agree. Yeah, I'm hoping for that as well. Oh, thank you. I, I love that. Um, yeah, let's, let's be radical. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I, I'm 100% on board. Um, Mandy, you're next. Hey, hey Kevin. Uh, I really like these demonstrations, by the way. Um, so just a question from a curious newbie, uh, and apologies if this is like somewhat ill-formed. Uh, I'm coming from a neuroscience uh, machine learning background. So let's say I were to design uh, a way to formalize certain biological systems as a series of transformations from one graph to another. I don't know how this formalization would be yet, uh, whether it's like Petri nets or Lindenmeyer systems, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, but basically, I have somewhat of a lofty goal in the hand wavy stage uh, where I want to formalize uh, graph representations of morphogenesis data of uh -huh. flatworms, so like uh, body shape palette changes over time, and it's represented as a graph, uh, and create like a bio theory checker uh, in a sense. Um, and I know it's somewhat controversial and maybe perhaps naive, uh, but I'd like to see if there's any like confluence or convergence towards like canonical forms, almost like biological platonic forms, if you will, uh -huh. uh, that are potentially occurring if you formalize these graph uh, dynamics in the rewrite sense, uh, uh -huh. you know, to turn like biology into an axiomatic deductive uh, discipline. Yeah. So my question is, would there be a way of using or creating a proof assistant software to fill in gaps in our series of graph rewrites like in the like in the program repair sense. Ah, uh -huh. so you you're going to need an AI person for this. So I, I can kind of imagine what, what what you could do now is if you were to come up with a model for your theory. Uh, you know, a, a, you know, physicists come up with physical models. You know, for the universe that sort of depend on mathematics, but. You know, in a in a sandbox like this, if you were to come up with a rigorous model for your theory, then you could type your th you know you could type your theory in modeling a flatworm, and and then it's there in the system, and you can manipulate it by hand, you know, no problem at all. But now, if you want to actually get the computer to make some intelligent remarks, then you have to ask the AI people, and I'm I'm not a computer scientist. You, and, and maybe what you have to do is 
give it some examples of what you're thinking of. Say, you know, this kind of, you know, here's a, here's a simple, naive example of a single-celled organism. Here's what I'm doing. And now here's a flatworm. Uh, can, can you help me here? And then you have to see what the AI says. And AI just say, Ran, and you, you never know what's going to happen until you do it. This is my impression with AI. And, and my, my guess is that what will happen is that it will be terrible. You know, you won't be able to do anything. It will, it will suggest naive things or won't even know where to start. But then if sufficiently many people start, think this is what happened with computer vision. You know, computer vision became a formalized question. It's like, here's a whole bunch of pictures. And uh, then computers were really bad at them. And then people tried to develop AIs that got better at them. And then eventually people had some good ideas. And then all of a sudden, computer vision was just solved. <laughs> You know, it, it, took, it took many years, but suddenly it was solved, and then you get self-driving cars. So it's the same sort of thing here. It would be very interesting. You know, the, f the first step you have to make, you know, this image net was a whole bunch of pictures. You know, first somebody made the database. First somebody made computers and the concept of a JPEG. And then somebody made the database. And then people made the AIs. And then people solved the problem. Right. So what we have now is... Uh, you know, we have we have the analog of the JPEG. Yeah, you know, we have this system here, and now what we're waiting. You know, you, we've got a general theory of what a JPEG is, and then you have to actually find some JPEGs of things. You have to find some pictures to start training. So what we need now is, you know, you need to write down a basic model next, and you you, you want you want to know what the computers can do with your model. The answer is probably nothing right now. But why don't you make the model anyway? You know, I want to know what computers can do with mathematics. And the answer is nothing right now, but we're making the model anyway. And I think, you know, I just think it's a phenomenally important thing to be doing, to be making mathematics in a system like this, because, because we're going to, you know, sooner or later, someone's going to come along and say, oh, actually, I've got the hang of it now. You know, the brilliant idea will come from a computer scientist. And all of a sudden, they're going to start proving that there's infinitely many prime numbers automatically, right? This system can't prove there's infinitely many prime numbers. I could define a prime number easy peasy. I define multiplication, but I can't get it to start thinking. But at some point in time, that, you know, that might happen. Or alternatively, we might just tell the computers about prime numbers. You know, how much stuff do you have to feed these things? We, maybe, we have to, maybe we have to teach the entire computer the undergraduate degree first, and then say, OK, there's the undergraduate degree. How are you going to go on from there? Right? May, maybe that's what will work. Or maybe someone will have a brilliant idea, and computers will start being sentient and making up prime numbers by themselves. I don't know when it will sort of, you know, when sentience will occur. Or by sentience, I mean things which will be useful to humans. So I have no idea what the answer to your question is, but I would thoroughly encourage you to start making toy models because once you've made toy models, then you can start asking concrete questions. Like, Thank you. Here's yeah. the data. Here's the data. I want the system to predict this. Yeah, we actually already have a database of oh, graph uh transformations, uh, uh -huh. but I'm still trying to come up with a formalization to capture that. But yeah, uh -huh. thanks. Yeah, sorry, I can't help. Thank you. Uh, Martin, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> this is really, a, again, another fascinating subject that I've, I've not delved into at all. And I really know, no, I've, I've heard of, of computer proofs going back to, you know, the, the, the four color map problem. Uh, and all the outrage that happened at that time, but you know, no understanding of, of how it all worked. Uh, when I look at, at you know, what a mathematician does and, and you know, what, what we do in general, we develop a language. I mean, it's a, it's a very sophisticated, complex language. We develop, we invent terms to, 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 uh, to describe objects that we find interesting. And, in, in what you showed us this morning, you defined, you know, zero, one, two, three, four. And, and you know, so you've defined a, a, some terms. And then the question is, is, is the computer system at the point that it can recognize when something is significant and, and assign a term to it? And so this whole concept of, of language, being able to, to represent things with terms and to use those in an abstract manner something that, that we can tell, we can write a program that says, use this term that I've, I've defined and, and work with it. But going beyond that seems like a, a task that, that's, that's the, if you want the, the, the 
intelligence task that, that doesn't seem to be anywhere close at this point. No, I agree. It's a, somehow, so here's, you know, what's Lean's definition of a ring? Here's just like the axioms for a ring, right? Yeah. You know, the axioms for a ring and some other boilerplate stuff. There's ring.adasoc. But humans have realized that things like rings and groups are really important. But to this dumb machine here, this dumb machine just sees the definition of ring. You know, we told it, you know, that a ring has a zero and a ring, a ring has an axiom called zero add, zero plus A is A and A plus zero is A. We write down these axioms. But as far as lean is concerned, you could just cross out two of these axioms and add two completely different axioms. And you would get a structure that I think to the computer is, 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 is indistinguishable from a ring. But it would, it would be utterly useless to, to a human being. You know, these things like rings, these are jewels. You know, these abstract concepts are, are, are brilliant ideas. And uh, the, the things that we think worthy of a name as, as somehow abstract algebraic concepts which have risen, you know, they bubble to the top because they've, they've turned out to be useful. And I have no idea how a computer, like there's, there's two questions, right? How, could, could you get a computer to prove theorems? You could kind of imagine that, you know, obviously it's an exponentially large search space, but on the other hand, you know, you could maybe it could pick up heuristics by looking at lots of proofs and ends up with a good nose you know how to how to get through knowing the definitions it has but then you could ask this other question is like can a computer invent a new a new definition that's useful to humans and that seems to me to, to be a whole lot harder so i i think the answer to your question is that we're, we're nowhere and yeah, again you talk to some you you know i talked to christian zegedy at google and he thinks yeah, yeah yeah computers will be doing this in 10 years you know but but somehow i i think you can accuse computer scientists of, it's very easy for a computer scientist to say that X will be happening within 10 years. As long as they keep saying that, as long as they never, they never start saying, oh, nine years, eight years. They get, you know, as long as they keep saying 10 years, then this is fine. I, I can't, I personally think that the definition of a ring is a stroke of genius. And, uh, and you know, every one of these axioms is dead important. And the moment you remove one of them, you know, you're gonna be in big trouble. Or, or add another one. And I, I don't understand how the computer can possibly differentiate between a ring and, and an object which is, looks like a ring, a distorted version of a ring. This is it's such a discrete thing. You distort one axiom slightly and the, object, and the, the concept becomes completely useless. It's a, it's a very discrete thing. And uh, so one, one reaction to this would be, okay, so if we don't think computers can invent great new ideas, why don't we just teach the computers all the ideas we've had so far? And you know, this is one of the things we're doing. You know, we're just making more and more definitions. If we want them to learn algebraic geometry, so we're defining schemes. You know, we're, defining, you know, we're defining cohomology. We'll be able to define cohomology of schemes. Because you can tell, you can tell this computer the vague conjectures, just simple points, simple conjectures about counting, you know, counting number of solutions to equations modulo a prime number. And it can't possibly prove them because it doesn't have the tools which are used. But if we actually teach it the tools as well, you know, which we're well on the way to doing, then you kind of start thinking, well, maybe now, you know, it, it becomes much more theoretically likely that a computer can start looking for proofs of the vague conjectures once it knows all the tools which humans use to prove them. But yeah, I, I, I have no idea how a computer could make new objects. But, but nonetheless, it's, it's an extremely useful thing. I mean, as a physicist, you know, I looked at, at something like mathematical, which is so widely used now because you know you want an integral, you want to do a calculation, it, 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 it's right there. Yeah, the objects have been built. Yeah, objects have been built within Mathematica. You know, this, so it, this it, is it, what it, makes it useful. You know, the, the earlier versions. You know, I remember when things started appearing. You know, so like, oh look, you know, Mathematica can can do sort of basic calculations in a new area now because the objects have been implemented, and it's just the same here. You implement new objects in your theorem prover, and suddenly it gives you have more capacity to do good. You can prove more theorems. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's humans doing it. I'm afraid. Thanks. Thank you, um, Stephen. I imagine you have, you have plenty to add here. I'm talking about mathematics. <laughs>
I don't, sorry, I'm, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a holiday day in the US, so I actually get to, to participate in this a little bit. I think my video is too silly to show. Um, the, the couple of comments, um, very interesting things you had to say. But um, uh, one thing I'm curious about, you know, there's a thing I did back in 2000 trying to find the simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra. And I believe that it remains the only example of a, an unexpected theorem proved automatically. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, I, I've been sort of on a hunt for other unexpected theorems proved automatically. It's one, one point. Another point is the actual proof of that is an incredibly complicated thing that in 21 years, despite various efforts from various people, including myself, there has been little that's been successful in actually quotes understanding that proof. But the question is, what would it mean to understand that proof? And you know, the way I, right, the way I see it is that what human mathematics has done is it provides various kind of named waypoints that are, you know, the famous theorem about this that we've given a name to, the famous theorem about that. Yeah, the and classification I think you, theorem or the structure theorem or something. Yeah. Right. And so one question that I have is, what is your sense of whether the collection of waypoint theorems that human mathematicians have found? Is, uh, is there any, you know, could there be a completely different mathematics that would have been found historically that is, that has different waypoint theorems and has either, either giving the same results or as, as current mathematics or, or different ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, great question. So let's annihilate the human race now and then let it reemerge. And, and, you know, invent, you know, it will invent the natural numbers and it will invent the statement of Fermat's last theorem. And eventually, because we know it can be proved, it will, it will invent a proof of Fermat's last theorem. And then you can step right. back and say, and did it use elliptic curves? And did it use modular forms? And did it use Gower representations? Or did it use a completely different route? And right. I suspect that in theory, in, in theory, I, it could use... I, I am so embedded. I, these things look so natural to me now. And you're suggesting, is there another way? You know, is there a modular form free way of proving Fermat's last theorem and instead proving it with just some wacky new concept that we won't come yes. up with? Yeah, why not? I, I don't see why. What do you think? I don't see why not. Yeah, yeah. I th I th look, I think the main question for mathematics is what is interesting? There's an infinite number of theorems, you know, given some axiom system or whatever, there's yeah. an infinite number of theorems you might prove. The question for us humans, it's like, you know, photographers picking, you know, which tree to photograph, so to speak. <laughs> you know, which things out there in the mathematical universe do we consider interesting enough to study? And I think that that is a, a you know, we build towers where we've, you know, we've, we've decided one thing is interesting, so we give it a name, and then we use that name thing to build more things. And that yeah. kind of builds us in these particular, you know, trajectories. Yeah. And... Uh, I mean, uh, so another, another thing I'm curious about. But, I mean, but, I did, you, but those yeah. trajectories, sometimes they have, we built, you know, we had Fermat's last theorem sitting around for 350 years and not being able to solve it. And then we built this tower of elliptic curves and the tower of modular forms and the tower of the Langlands philosophy and profound conjectures. But then suddenly, you know, all of a sudden, they all come together and you've proved a theorem about, about numbers. So this justifies the towers, right? They're not just right. abstractions for their own sake. You know, they, they, this proves that in some sense they were the right towers for some notion of rights. Well, right. I mean, that's a question. If you look in proof space, <clears throat> you know, you can ask there is a trajectory that goes from our axioms to Fermat's last theorem. But there will be other GD6, so to speak, in yeah. Berlin. They're probably not GD6. They're probably very much not shortest paths. But there are no doubt other paths from the axioms to Fermat's no, last but, theorem. I, I suspect the shortest path would be incomprehensible. In, to humans, yeah, I agree. It, it throws away all of the it throws away all of the excess knowledge that the geodesics would be but this human comprehend you can imagine there being a totally different human comprehensible proof no, I, I, I mean i, I guess so. mokizuki is announcing a completely different human comprehensible proof using his you know using his ideas and uh you know although perhaps the community hasn't accepted it yet and yeah why not in another 50 years time we might have to, yeah I, I yeah your idea is very appealing i Sure, we, there are plenty, there are more towers yet to be discovered. Right, well, the question is, by the way, I mean, when you think about two different paths, you know, that's, that's in a sense, you know, lots of homotopies in, 
in in the structure oh, yeah. of the proof space and so on, right? Are they the and same so can, proof? <laughs> well, yes, right. I mean, and then you, then you have a a proof of the equivalence of proofs, and that's a whole. You know, that's something which, to my knowledge, not a lot of practical mathematics has been done on. I mean, plenty of people have said, "I've got a proof of this result." Occasionally, there's a second proof, as you say, but the equivalence of proofs. I don't think practical mathematicians, and I don't think the proof assistant community has done much on that, or have they? So, well, there's... Lean is not smart enough to even comprehend the difference uh, between two proofs. So I, here's an example. So here, here's a proposition there, and I'll give you... Here's H1 is a proof of P, and H2 is a proof of P, and I claim that H1 equals H2 and the proof is, is true by definition. So lean has been specifically designed to not see, to not be able to even tell the difference I between see. proofs. But, but you could, homotopy but, type theory, you know, you mentioned homotopy theory. These yeah, homotopy yeah. type theory systems, like you, know, you can build them on top of Kark and uh, there are certain systems that do use these. Then it is, becomes meaningful to ask if two proofs are equal and to even ask how to make one proof how, you know, how to move one proof yes. into another proof. And there you have a whole bunch of people working with this stuff, but my impression is that this homotopy type, I mean, it's taken inspiration from classical homotopy theory, where we're moving paths in spaces, by, by which I mean, you know, specific subspaces of R to the N, like tori and whatever, and spins. But now people have started at trying to analyze, you know, moving between proofs. But somehow there's so many complications in making the foundational systems. My, my impression is that this is just, they're just at the beginning, these homotopy okay, so, type theory people. They have a so, definition of what it means for two proofs to be equal, but they haven't done much with it yet. But there is plenty of time. Uh, so I'll tell you one thing that uh, uh, has come out of our physics project that uh, Jonathan Gorard is working on, which is in our physics project, these, uh, uh, you know, the, the histories in quantum mechanics are basically like proofs in, in you know, these proof systems. And so one of the things we just started doing is making a proof simplifier that is based on doing, uh, using equational theorem proving to, applied to the symbolic representation of a proof. Uh -huh. And this seems, this seems to be working rather well. So in other right. words, you know, it's not particularly useful to humans. No, but it's, it's tidying things up somehow. Yes, so yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's transforming the symbolic representation of a proof to the symbolic representation of another proof. Right. And it turns out that the specific models that we have in our physics project are sort of flexible enough to be able to represent all pieces of that, that process. So, I, I don't know what the results will be, but, you know, we, we now actually have the technology to do this. Oh, um, that's interesting. I don't, are, you, are you doing this within a theorem prover, or you just made your own... You doing it with yeah, I mean, so, so in... in, 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 in Mathematical Wolfram language, you know, we have this thing called find equational proof, which is ultimately based on that the main library it uses is Waldmeister, which is an efficient, you know, uh, uh -huh. uh, automated theorem. Yeah, yeah, one of these system. ATPs, yeah. Right. It's, it's, uh, we, we've, you know, we, we built it in, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something now, and it's, we've been steadily cleaning it up. And it's, it, it was a good piece of code to begin with, but it's, it's, um, uh, but yes, so it's, it's based on equational theorem prover. It's, you know, as equational theorem provers go, it's nice and efficient. I mean, the... Yeah, you know, yeah, we, yeah. We, So another thing I'm curious about in terms of the what theorems are interesting. So I, I did look last year, I, for various reasons, I happened to look at the sort of empirical metamathematics of Euclid. So I was looking at the, <laughs> the kind of network structure of Euclid's, you know, right. 460 or so theorems. Okay? And so you can ask questions about sort of what are the most important, you know, as, as you look at that network, which theorems did he use most of and so on? Yeah, well, for example, did he use Pythagoras' theorem loads because he's got a name, so it sounds like it's important, or was it actually an end point? You know, it was just a beauty, yeah, exactly. like a beauty in itself, yeah. Right, so, so then I, I did, um, by the way, the, the one fact is that the most difficult theorem in Euclid, in the sense of most steps, is the proof that there are five platonic solids. And that oh. takes, I think, 20 steps or something from the, um, from the axioms. Excellent. Um, but but um, I, I tried to do the same thing with both lean and metamass. Uh, yeah, I read the blog post. Right, right. I mean, I, I only, look, I just did the very beginning of that. Somebody should do that better. 
But, you know, in the, the thing that would be interesting there is this question of given the corpus that's been built up in lean, you know, what are the graph theoretically important theorems and so on? Mm -hmm. which, which I think is, you know, that, that's, there's, a, there's a big enough corpus that that type of question should be readily answerable. And I just did the very beginning of trying to answer that. So I'm yeah, just curious. We, we, um, we do have tools to, um, we did develop some tools to, to analyze, to try and, you know, to try and visually analyze things. Let me, I'll perhaps show you, can I show you? There we go. This is, we, we define perfect, a perfectoid space is a very complex mathematical structure. That, uh, that me and a couple of co-authors defined, me and Masso and Comalan defined two years ago. And this was, and Masso made a, made a graph of uh, the things that we, so there's all sorts of tiny little, there's many, many, many lines connecting all these dots and each dot represents, right. you know, one, one concept. And then, so we have been playing with these, you know, we were really in some sense making art here. So wait a minute, so you proved some particular thing. We and made this definition. Is the foundation. Okay. We defined, um, we defined, we proved the theorem that the empty set was a perfectoid space. But there was, there's the definition of a perfectoid space and his various other things and the more important things we made slightly bigger. So wait a minute, so, but those things led into that definition and, and one yeah, definition yeah, yeah. might have depend on many other definitions. So why, I mean, if, if you made this into some kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, what, th there could be a layered graph, which at the end of it, comes up with your definition and has all these things feeding into it. Yes, this is, is some right? kind of directed, this is a directed graph. But yeah, you just, right. but just I mean, but the so, so the things further away are the things that had more steps, but, but, you know, had, there were more steps needed to get to your definition, is that right? So I mean, yeah. in other words, I can say that topological space is closer to your definition, or topological algebra is closer to your definition than something on the other side of the screen. There were, there were than all lists, of, for example. We, we got some, obviously got some graph, you know, graph drawing software to, to make this stuff. And there was a certain amount of sorting out, but to, to a certain extent, it sort of organized itself. And, and then we just we just moved things around. We did a lot of stuff with topological rings, so it doesn't surprise me at all that uh, topological spaces and topological algebras and rings are, are sort of really nearby. Whereas these are, things like lists and finite sets are obviously much more mathematically primitive objects. So it, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. So what do you mean? Surprise me if from, these things were yeah. genuinely further away. So here's the thing that I'm, I'm curious about, if, if I could. The, the um, you know you look at these different proof assistant systems, and they have you know, you can as assume different underlying axioms, but yet they seem to somehow be able to s prove the same human interesting mathematical theorems. Yeah. Is that, is that a true statement? And um, I, I think that one could, one could define perfectoid spaces in metamath, you know, in a set theory prover, mm -hmm. and then we're going to attempt to make this picture and the picture would look exactly the same. The, the same yeah, sort so, of things would be being used in the same ways. So doesn't yeah. it surprise you that you know you change the underlying axioms and it, it you would think that the tower that you would build would just be a completely different tower <laughs> does it does it surprise you that you end up with the same human interest in mathematics even though the foundations are different it's it used this was something this is something that i've simply got used to i think I, I, I realized that after a while, I wasn't thinking about, are we doing set theory or are we doing type theory? I moved into some mode where I was doing mathematics and I didn't care if it was being represented internally as sets or types. Because, because once, we have a, you know, once we have a good API for everything, you're, you're just interacting with objects via their, via their interface. I don't, care. I don't care if the elliptic curve is being stored as a set or a type. I just want to make sure that I can do all the things that undergraduates want to do with elliptic curves. So, it, so it, it's, but it's, it's, you make a different foundation, but then you still make the same, you still, ah, you're, are you I, suggesting, I <laughs> yeah. if I did mathematics in type, are you suggesting that there could be some specific towers that we make, which are really specific to set theory and have no kind of type theoretic analog? Well, that's because, a question. But so, so to me, this is a fa an important question in the philosophy of mathematics, right? Because one possibility is that mathematics is like thermodynamics. 
That is, you know, the equilibrium behavior of a gas is largely independent of the detailed, you know, interactions between the molecules. So, right, so that's one possibility, is that it actually doesn't matter. That for the, at the large scale, when you go up far above the molecular level, so to speak, the, the, the quotes, the thermodynamics of mathematics is the same, independent of its kind of microscopic structure. But that's not something that I think we, we've seen you know, I think that, I suspect that that is what's going on, but that that's telling us something about kind of what mathematics is. Yeah, I, I also, I find that a very appealing picture. And, and now looking at this thing here, it says topological algebra and rings and blah, 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 but it isn't, you know, who cares about set theory or type theory? It's, I mean, this is in some sense evidence. I, I, I think we could, in some sense, completely transplant this definition over to metamath and- uh, right. It, it would just it would just look the same. So what does that tell you about the, the axiomatic foundations of mathematics? Because that's basically it's, telling you. It tells you that mathematics doesn't need math. axioms. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. But Gauss and Euler knew that, right? <laughs> they, didn't, yes. they didn't have a clue what the axioms were. They were just they were still proving things like quadratic reciprocity. Yeah, who cares right. about the axioms? There's, just go with intuition. But then the algebraic geometers ran into trouble, right? Yeah. <laughs> things, things started going a bit pear shaped in the. Uh, in the early 20th century, and they, and they needed to be because people started people started being more audacious with with, the, with what they were doing with their yes. objects. They're like, what well, what is a function? Are all functions continuous? You know, I don't know. What is a function anyway? And suddenly, then you had to start pinning you had to start pinning things down to make sure that humans were treating objects properly. But there's lots of different ways to pin them down, and, and it turns out that maybe we reject axiom systems which don't let us do the kind which don't let us treat mathematical ideas in the way we want to treat them. Is that what's happening? We talk well, about I don't know. several I mean... different foundations of mathematics, but anything that won't actually let me do you know, mathematics the way I want to do it is somehow rejected. Oh, that, so, although so, that's, yeah, I don't know, intuitionism is, a, we, we heard a talk about you know, the role of intuitionism in physics. And that's a different foundation of mathematics in which you can do strictly you know, a, a different collection of things and all functions are continuous. And that has had some use. I'm not sure he could do this stuff, though. There you go. In constructive mathematics. Constructive mathematics, I'm not even sure we could make that picture. That's a, that's a different foundation. Uh, or one could make something which constructivists would argue was an approximation to this picture. But if you actually started looking at the details, it would turn out that under the hood, things are actually behaving very differently. And you, and you so, can't do the things. Sorry, so, on. you know, I tried many, many years ago, I tried this question of, you know, just pick axiom systems at random. Yeah. What kinds of theorems are true in those axiom systems? You, you, this is okay. what you mentioned in your talk, right? Probably, yeah. yeah I, I probably, yeah. I, I, yeah, right. Oh, yes, yes, I did show that. Yeah, right. The, 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 um, uh, right, but so, so, I mean, the, the, I could find nothing special with respect to their theorem distribution for those axioms which actually get used by humans. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So, so we just hit on a random collection and then thought, yeah, let's go with it. Well, but, but it could be the case that in some sense, because we're noticing that it actually doesn't matter whether we used you know, lean or metamath, there may be something different going on. That is, the things that we are eventually building as human interest in mathematics Maybe, you know, it could be that in, in these axiom systems with the right definitions and so on, we'd actually end up with something that looks like the same mathematics. I mean, that's a, that's a bizarre possibility. In other words, that it, you know, it's like different instruction sets for a computer and, uh -huh. you know, standard computation universality, that it actually really, really doesn't matter. Yes, exactly. But I, I don't know how that... Um, Church's uh, thesis. Is, well, all, yes, is all mathematics the same? <laughs> yes. Right, and, and it's merely what we choose to, that, you know, that given any foundation, we can choose to implement the mathematics that we have, you know, that, that we think is intuitively useful, so to speak. I, I don't know. The, the, the reason that I think Lean has taken off recently is, is not because it has necessarily the right foundations, but I think it's just because it's been designed by, you know, professional, you know, by professional, by Leo de Mura, who's basically a genius. It's not necessarily the fact that the type theory is chosen. So, so, yes. so I, I'm not a coder, right? But I can imagine, I mean, say I decided to write a computer, you know, a computer algebra package. I, it's probably not going to be as good as Mathematica, 
But that's not because I don't understand mathematics in some sense. It's because I don't understand how to implement it on a computer. And, that, and that's another different thing. Which is, is, yeah. is, is, is not just the axioms. It's the way that they're it's the way that they're implemented. With lean, I think they they seem to have been implemented very well. Right. So no, I mean we 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 different question. We we've been doing a bunch of stuff with lean for a bunch of years with the mostly with the Carnegie Mellon folk, I guess. Uh -huh. um, uh, and uh, um, I mean, one of the things that I must say I would I would love to ask, but it's perhaps too irrelevant here, is is you know I'm trying to understand you know. What what is the actual use for practice? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how should we best make use of proof assistant type ideas in the context of Mathematica, and I keep on grappling with this and keep on not succeeding in really understanding. Uh -huh. it. This is why you, for example, implemented you put Waldmeister in because like no, that was, that, was, that was 20 years ago. That was right, that was that's sort of a part reason. of a general, you know. Yeah. You know, let, yes. Let's, let's try and put in a simple one of these systems and see what happens. See what we can do with it. And now right. you're thinking, now what, can we put in a more complex one and see what we can do with it? Well, except that that's, a, that's an automated theorem program. We can really do things like, for example, a, you know, recent thing is simplifying quantum circuits. You know, we now have a very fine way to do that because we can now use sort of equational theorem proving as a, a fundamental building block for things that we're thinking about. And the thing that is, right, so that's, it just becomes a little black box, like, you know, factoring an integer or something. Right. Um, and so you can build on top of it and take it for granted, so to speak. And I think that's the, the um, and by the way, I, I, you know, to, I think in terms of the building of systems, you know, the, maybe because I've spent the last, I don't know, 40 years of my life doing this, but, you know, the, the overall design of the system and how all the pieces fit together, the thing that mathematicians don't necessarily admit as a thing, which is sort of pick your notation and pick all of your whatever, that turns out to be really critical. Yeah, in, the implementation the, issues that we can so easily overlook no, as mathematicians. No, no, it's not implementation. The implementation oh, okay. is a different thing. It's the functional design of the system. That is, you've got, you know. So in, is this in, the axioms? No. In some it's, sense? It's, it's, well, I, that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's, you know, we've got 6,000 built in functions in our language. And what are those functions? How do they fit together? You know, how does the result from some graph theory thing relate to what we can do in, I don't know, uh, image processing or something or in machine learning? Um, uh -huh. It's all of that. And, and what that requires to make that all work is a pretty deep understanding of each of these areas because you need to understand what is the essence of each area and how, you know, what, what are the right primitives to use to build up that area so that it connects to others. And I think, you know, that's, that's the, you know, to, well, perhaps because I've spent so much of my life doing that, you know, that, that I think is the hardest part. And I think it's the part that people understand least well. But, but uh -huh. I mean, but, 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 I mean, which is, which is what, so I'm curious, you know, when you look at Lean, you look at Mathematica, and, you know, I had, I had an idea about a few years ago, which I could try out here, which is, okay, so pure mathematician walks up to Wolfram Alpha. You know, they might say, Wolfram Alpha is kind of useless to a pure mathematician because a pure mathematician's workflow is quite different from what it does, which right. is just, you know. But then I had the following idea. Let, let's say, you know, you can type into Wolfram Alpha something like, I don't know, uh, you know, Iridium or something. And it will say, here's what I know about Iridium. It's a bunch of, you know, bunch of facts and so on. Imagine that you could walk up to it and say, you know, let F be a field with these properties, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Tell me and what then, you know about those. <laughs> right. Tell, tell, tell me, tell me what, what you know about that. And there are yeah. two approaches one can imagine taking. One is, you know, take the three million theorems that humans have published and try and essentially search those theorems for things which are, you know, somehow related to the, the setup that was given. Yeah. That's one possibility. The other possibility is try and generate you know, them yourself. It. Right. And then figure out which ones you think are interesting enough to show yeah. the human. I mean, it's like search engine ranking. You, yeah. know, you have to ask the question, you know, of all these possible results, which ones are interesting enough to show to a human. But I, yeah. I don't know whether that's a, um, I mean, in this question about which ones are interesting enough to show to a human, you know, I, I know one example in Boolean algebra where I think there's a criterion for saying which things are interesting. But again, that's something that would be lovely to know from Lean. But let's say from Lean, you've got a big corpus of results that people thought were interesting. You can enumerate all possible theorems. Now you have to ask the question, can you make some statistical or machine learning or other 
technique for understanding the question in the ocean of all possible theorems, yeah. which ones were actually given in lean. Give, give it a collection of J, give it a collection of pictures. Can you figure out which ones are, which ones are beautiful? Isn't that really? Oh, right. That's <laughs> absolutely terrifying, doesn't it? It's, well, I mean, look, we, we did an experiment years ago. We had this thing called Wolfram Tones, which is a, an algorithmic music generator. And uh, it, um, it uses the cellular automata and so on. And the way that works is it goes off and it tests, you know, a thousand cellular automata and it has certain heuristics for deciding which ones it thinks are, you know, musically interesting in different styles. Uh. <laughs> so, and what I found interesting about the use of that site, I thought, well, it's, you know, I didn't think it was that good, but, but the thing that surprised me is human composers, many of them have told me, oh, I find that site useful. Which oh. is very bizarre. And they say <laughs> it's useful because it gives me kind of an idea for some, you know, it is generating at random these things which are, you know, th th in a sense, they're not just random notes. They're notes that come from a simple rule. They have a, they have a right. logic to them. Um, but it's generating some little ditty, so to speak, which the human can then dress up. I mean, I would have expected right, can be to be inspired by. Yeah. Right. I would have expected <laughs> to be the other way around, that the human would give the inspiration and the computer would dress it up. But it's actually the opposite, at least in the examples that I've heard. So, so it's a mean, very interesting story. It's great. Right. I mean, uh, the. Sorry. Sorry, I was going to say, I think Maximilia wants to chime in. And I see several hands raised. I don't know if anyone wants to contribute to this discussion or change topics. If you want to contribute to the discussion, feel free to do so now. I think Marcel and Michael were earlier. Yes. But my question is not directly co uh, connected to this discussion. Yeah. So. The, the, my question is directly correct. Uh, actually, the, what came up in my mind is this, uh, this thing that in microbiome research, there's not a thing that uh, different microbiomes have radically different species, but end up in the same function. So the microbiome of my wife could be very different, but uh, we can digest the same food uh, in a very good <laughs> way. And, and these pictures look very similar. Um, you know, obviously, like in many fields of network science, we end up with a spring embedded layout with um, some clusters. But then there is probably the stuff we don't see because it's a multidimensional object. There is these kind of wormholes, like things that are connected to many things across the clusters and stuff like that. And so the question is, how universal is this? And so it's sort of a question for Kevin and Stephen. Um, is there, can, we, can we expect something like a very, very general systems theory where we don't solve all the other sciences with math, but math is also solved by the systems theory? Do, I, maybe Stephen knows more about this than I do. <laughs> well, I, can, I mean, I could say the, the remarkable thing that might be happening is that this thing that we invented for physics might end up being that. And, and it also turns out to be a thing that in different forms people have invented in higher category theory and invented in, you know, a bunch of different places. I mean, I, you know, too early to say for sure, but this, this whole sort of structure of these, uh, you know, this multi-way graph, it, otherwise, well, I guess it has, it has a bunch of probably even more obscure names in other fields. But, um, uh, you know, there is some, you know, there's a, a now an increasing indication that yes, that's a foundation for physics. It's potentially also a foundation for mathematics. I think it also is potentially a foundation for economics um, and maybe biology. Uh, and um, you know, so yes, the, the answer is it's possible and it looks like it might even be you know, in sight, so to speak. Uh, I mean, I, the, but I mean, I think your, your comment about um, uh, sort of the, the microbiome, and there are just so many examples of this also in biology, for example, where, where different raw material is, is, is put together to achieve the same function. And, you know, that, that is in a sense, you know, in part just a story of universal computation, I think. That, you know, there's this one thing that can be achieved, which is universal computation, but there are many different ways to achieve it. And that's just a, you know, it's a fundamental fact about, about formal systems that that's possible. And I, I don't think mathematics has ingested that idea as much as it should. I, mean, I think, to me, the most surprising thing, maybe Kevin 
could comment on this. I mean, the most surprising thing to me about mathematics is that human mathematicians don't get sort of, don't run splat into undecidability all the time. I mean, yeah, it's just a long way away from the kind of questions we're interested in. And is that because we have good tech? Is that because our t is there some kind of intrinsic notion of good taste which keeps us away from undecidable problems? Or, or did our notion of taste become... You know, because obviously you don't want to spend your life working on undecidable problems. I mean, unless you're a set theorist specifically trying to do... You know, spe specifically interesting. You know, most mathematicians are trying to decide their problems, uh, and, unless you're you know, specifically working in logic and trying to generate undecidable ones. And is, is it, a, I mean, yeah, is it, I mean, Diffantian equations are undecidable in general, right? But Fermat's last theorem turned out to be decided. And uh, this weak Goldbach conjecture seems to have been decided. Why is it that the questions we're focusing on, whereas, whereas we can construct undecidable problems, but they, to a large, I, I guess, is Magidor here? I mean, he gave examples, but uh, you know, he, he argued that some of them are natural, but I would say that maybe nowadays they're looking less natural than, than perhaps they were the, when they were discovered, and maybe kind of humans were moving away from certain areas if they, you know, the, the whole I, I understandability. It must be the sociological and historical fact, but I think this point about, you know, how far away are the undecidable propositions? You know, a, a, a thing I've spent lots of effort on is finding, you know, the simplest example of computation universality in system X, Y, Z, and so on. And the answer is those simplest examples are very simple. And for example, in Diophantine equations, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if three variables, cubic equations, already has undecidability. But the, the difficulty of finding, the difficulty of proving that tends proving to be very hard. Right. But so there are plenty exactly. of people working on cubic equations in three variables. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, right, and so you do wonder whether <laughs> at some point people are going to start running into these things. Right. I mean, the, the, um, yeah, I mean, anyway. The, 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 uh, but I, I mean, in, in your work in, in, you know, proof assistance and so on, you, the things that you say, I want to prove this, I assume that you always expect, I mean, have you ever actually in practice run into something where you seriously say, I want to prove this, and where you know, the lean, I mean, lean isn't in a position to say to you, sorry, that's undecidable, I right. think. But other um, humans are. I mean, yes. forget, forget proof assistance, you could ask within mathematics, do, do people work on problems and then other people come along and say, do you know what, mate, that's going to be undecidable. Um, I think that we've been, we've been seeing that for Hilbert's problems, right? I mean, that, you know, they've been being picked off one at a time. And I think, uh, you know, my, my own personal amusement now, Hilbert's sixth problem, which is the axiomatization of physics, I think we can, you know, with, with our efforts, I think we can say that is another Hilbert problem that turns out to be in some sense undecidable. Ah. Um, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> anyway, sorry. All right. But, but, many, but many of the problems just were decidable and decided. I mean, some, yes. in some sense, some of the problems were, some of the problems were a bit vague. Um, one has to, right. you know, the decision is trying to work out what he actually meant. And you, you can interpret them in different ways. And, you know, some things, some things are known and some things are not known. But, it, but know, the vast majority get decided. The question is, how hard should you push? In other words, if something is not decidable with this amount of effort, is, is, you know, what's the likelihood that it be actually undecidable? And the surprising thing are these, are these you know, stragglers like Fermat's Last Theorem that turn out to be decidable but take hundreds of years to decide. Yeah. And the, the question is, is that, you know, for human-picked problems, is that, you know, is there possibility of stragglers? Will it be the case that most, I mean, if, if mathematics was too easy, there would be nothing to do. So one has right. to live in this zone between, you know, the trivial and the undecidable. And the question is sort of how thick is that zone? Yeah, I, I don't think that's very well understood. But my belief is that all these fancy things like the Langlands philosophy and Grothendieck's conjectures on motives and things that motivate the people in you know, my area of mathematics, my belief is that all these things are decidable and uh, you know, it's just a matter of time before we decide them. The Burton, Swinners and Dyer conjecture could in theory be undecidable, I guess, true but not provable. But my guess is that it's true and provable and uh, you know, I'm hoping that before I die, I'll see a proof. It's, it's, that, that's my... And it, now the question is, am I an optimist or am I a realist? And I kind of think that my, my belief... I don't think that mathematicians would work on problems if they felt that they might be undecidable. 
And yet, yes. it's, it's known that Diophantine equations can be undecidable. You know, the general theory is undecidable. And yet, I know plenty of people working on the theory of Diophantine equations, because it is bizarre, really. Maybe we're just irrational optimists. <laughs> Well, and the question is, with one of these fancy theorems, you know, if it is proved, will you understand the proof? If it's proved by a machine, yeah, well, if the likelihood is, it, right, right, and then what's the point? I mean, let's uh -huh. say that, that. Well, now we know it's not. Now we know it's not undecidable. So that's the, so <laughs> what? Major so what, so humans so to keep working on it and finding a proper proof. No, but I'm curious. What, what is the what is the real takeaway from the fact that it's not undecidable? It's something about the strength of these axiom systems relative to the thing you're trying to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in some sense a very weak, it's in some sense a very weak piece of knowledge. But, uh, oh, but very it's, interesting. Yeah, you know, it's mathematics has got fashions, right? This is, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. You're pointing out these giant towers. You know, you do find people that are working away, you know, in some obscure corner of mathematics, proving theorem after theorem about these objects that they they care about and hardly anyone else does. But you know, if mathematics mathematicians sort of believe that these objects aren't ever going anywhere and they're not going to be used to prove great theorems, then these things can become un unfashionable. So fashion in mathematics is, you know, all of these things on this, you know, on this picture we can see, there's sort of you know basic fashionable stuff or stuff that fashionable stuff builds from. And so, you know, it's another it's, you know, what what are the interesting theorems? What are the fashionable theorems? This is another very bizarre. You know, it's somehow a human centric viewpoint, but fashions within mathematics most definitely do exist. I mean, this, oh. this, this proof theory stuff now seems to be fashionable. And the proof of that is, you know, I've been asked to speak at the ICM and somehow, you know, these have existed for 50 years. And I don't think they've had talks about this stuff at the ICM before. Sorry, yes, right, so I, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt this fascinating discussion, which I really want to continue with. Uh, but I think what we are going to do is do the closing remarks now as advertised. So it's just going to take uh, just a few minutes, I would say five to ten minutes. And then I am very keen to stay afterwards and continue with the debate. I'm just concerned with the people who are expecting yeah, yeah, yeah. the it's final session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so if yes. it's, no, 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 but I really want to continue with this. And no, I, I, so I, I can certainly stay around. Uh, so if you don't mind, we can do the closing remarks now. Go for um, it. And then we can continue with the discussion if, if that's not too inconvenient, if that sounds all right Go for, for everyone. It. Yes? Yes, okay. exactly. Um, so so we, we wanted to, I mean, just wrap things up. Uh, absolutely don't want to uh, cut the conversation. It was fascinating. It's perhaps the most interesting topic, in my opinion, about this whole thing is, you know, meta mathematics, how we prove things, how we get interested in one object or another. Uh, so let's just, just briefly uh, recap and, and, and wrap up because we did advertise that you get a chance to say a, a few things or, you know, a few thoughts of, of what this conference was to you and, and suggestions or whatever. Um, so, so let me just, first of all, say um, thank you to all the speakers again. I mean, this, this was absolutely humbling to, to, to begin with, uh, to get the responses. And obviously this experience has been uh, super inspiring. I mean, at a personal level, and I hope that everyone else agrees that this, this has been absolutely, um, well, um, fantastic. Anyway, so, so yeah, um, Laura. Yeah, no, yeah, I have enjoyed so much. And out of this conference, I've got so much food for thought to occupy my mind for the rest of my life, or several lives, sadly. And this whole conference, from the initial idea to its final realization, has surpassed our expectations at each stage of the organization process. It has kept getting better and better. So thank you one more time uh, to all of our speakers for the thought-provoking talks and to all of the participants for being so active in the discussions like just now, um, because that was really our goal, to offer a forum for certain conversations to happen and fostering dialogue rather than one-sided approaches. Um, so yeah, thank you really to all of you. And while, while we are at the, with the thanks, um, I guess I would also like to thank my colleagues, Carlos, who was the one who had the initial vision for this event and has been working really hard to make it a reality. And Alvaro, who is in the shadows, he might seem invisible, but his work uh, certainly is not. And without his admin support and all his work on the website, this would have been very different, not as well organized for sure. So yeah, it's been a joint effort of a very small team and we all feel very happy and, and proud of what we've made together, I think. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so just very, very brief words on what to expect next, uh, because obviously this is this this was meant to be sort of the launch event uh, for the international, um, I, I guess, projection of, of SEMF, which has been a thing in Spain for a few years now, but we wanted to sort of become this thing that, that does this kind of events. Um, so just to very briefly say that we are looking to, um, you know, have similar meetings, uh, maybe in person, maybe with a physical component, because uh, probably things are looking better. And that we are also looking actively towards, um, well, we, we want to have a, a more um, structured organization behind this. And by that, we only mean that we need uh, some new members to come uh, join sort of the core of the organization. At the moment, it's basically myself, Laura, and, and Alvaro. And, uh, and so we're looking, at perhaps probably sort of the younger profile for this kind of role, because we are also looking to uh, sort of a, an advisor sort of role, someone who is connected with the idea that believes in the idea, but, you know, probably a more senior uh, kind of profile, uh, more established. And so you, if you feel that this is interesting to you in any, in any way and for either of the roles, and again, they're, they're not exclusionary in any sense, but we, we expect that the profiles that will be more appealing to are, are kind of different. Uh, so do, do approach us. Uh, we might approach you uh, perhaps in, in, in coming weeks uh, in, in these terms. And uh, as, a, as a closing uh, moment, we wanted to give you the chance to, to say a few things if, if you wanted. Um, I mean, I, I'm hesitant to say use the, the raise hand button because it, it feels way too inorganic. Um, but, but I mean, I think it's, it's, we're small enough of a group to, to just go organically. Uh, so if you want to say something, just uh, feel free um, to, you know, say whatever you, you want to say. At this point. I, I was really, people like Karen Lee Overman's talk, things like, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to get much out of these random talks, which is so far away from my specialty, but I thoroughly enjoyed, I thoroughly enjoyed, I mean, I, I mentioned Karen Lee because she's here, but I thoroughly, that was one of the talks I particularly enjoyed. Thank, thank you very much for yeah, it's, it's a nice change to spend a week not actually doing mathematics and doing other things. And Andrea as well. Yeah, lo lots of people. Same Th year. Thank you. Thank you. Same year was really nice and really helpful to have uh, different perspectives on uh, kind of the same topic, or at least to understand how many topics we think are the same topic. Great. Well, that's fantastic to hear. We're actually also going to send you a feedback form, like a post-conference feedback form. Um, so if you could please fill in that, it would be super useful for us to know what has worked, what hasn't, and to make future events um, better. Because as Carlos said, we're like very much looking forward to keep doing this, uh, perhaps even have a regular numerosity thing or on other topics and some of them hopefully in person again as carlos said uh, in uh, the real tabark island and perhaps have some paella in the breaks <laughs> we'll see um so yeah please do fill in the feedback form that's going to be really helpful so i just wanted to say thank you and uh, i was i was uh very pleased at how much of the conference uh, I thought uh, I understood. Being an archaeologist and not a mathematician, sort of, a, sort of the the uh, the uh, uh, the token uh, fish out of water kind of thing. But uh, I, I thought they were all very informative, and I and there were there were several people I got into uh, interesting discussions with, and I and I hope we continue that discussion uh, past the conference uh, because I think I think uh, my work uh, is critically informed by what mathematicians think about numbers um, as, as, as limited and imperfect as my understanding of what mathematicians do and think about numbers. I still think I, as much as I can understand it, it's an important element to, to incorporate into, into my work on the historical realization of those concepts. So um, please do um, uh, keep in touch. And, and uh, I, I also just wanted to say thank you to the conference organizers. I, I thought for an online conference and and they can be um, they can be very focused on delivering the presentation and not uh, um, fostering the discussion afterwards. And I thought this one was particularly well organized for discussion. I, I really liked the the hour of of Q and A that that followed each 
each presentation. Um, it, it, it's not as good as being in Scotland, able to go to the pub afterwards, but of course, um, you know, as a, as a, as a, you know, uh, uh, doing what we must to carry on during the pandemic, I, I thought this was uh, as, as good as a, a setup as I have yet seen anyone do. So well done to the organizers uh, in particular. So thanks so much. Thanks. Hey, hey. Yeah, I can also only agree with everything currently said. So, so much to thank you so much to you, Laura, Carlos, um, and and Albert. I think this was a beautifully organized conference. And um, in addition to all the wonderful talks, that gave me a lot of new um, things to to think about. Um, what I also really appreciated was not only that there was so much time and space for discussion. Um, but also the way that we engage with each other's work and, and with different ideas across disciplines. So, so I really got the impression that this was very constructive, really a joint effort to, to better understand what um, number is, uh, well, what numerosity is. And, um, and that's an, another thing that, that, that I really, really um, uh, appreciated. And I also hope that we all yeah, stay in, in touch and, and, and just um, yeah, continue our journey together. So thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Regina. Thanks very much. I say I think this was just a terrific prompt for a conference of uh, something that just isn't, I, I don't know what field it counts as being in, and that's a very good thing. And that's, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm just sorry that my day job didn't allow me to participate more than I've been able to, but terrific thing. It's a very nice way of putting it. I mean, you don't really know what, the, yeah, how to what box to put the conference in. That can only be a good thing, right? That was the point. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Carlos and Laura. It's been a huge success. It's been really inspiring. Thank you so much. And obviously, all of the speakers as well. Thank you so much. Well, in that case, I'm um, I'm, I'm itching to ask another question, but I, I maybe I shouldn't do that. No, no, no. I mean, as we said, we want, we want the, we want the conversation to continue after this. This was just a formality. We wanted to get it out of the way. Just remind you again that we, we don't ask for money. We don't. We try to keep events as free and accessible as possible. But the only currency that we demand in return is feedback, good, uh, honest, and detailed feedback. So we have the the survey for that. We are gonna push the button after this meeting, and you get the email. So, um, so I'm yeah. sorry, I will have to leave, but um, I'll, I'll promise also my feedback, and and we'll be good. Yeah. Uh, very well. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Also, bad things. Please find bad things because we need to do it somehow. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Andrea. That's been amazing. Um, no, Stephen, by all means, um, go ahead. I, I, my, 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 my question is, uh, the, did a, did a sing, is it possible that a single person invented numbers for humans? Question one. Oh, and question Karen. two. <laughs> we have I, an answer. I, 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 I see her shaking I, I have, her head. <laughs> well, I, I, I had a chance to listen asynchronously to, to some, much of Karen's talk. but um, That's another uh, great part of this conference, is that I've, I've not been able to go to all of the talks because I've had meetings, but I've been able to listen afterwards. Right, so, so is that, I, that was my first question. My second question is, is it possible that something which is somehow functionally equivalent to numbers was invented and we still don't understand from the artifacts that were left that that thing correspond to, corresponds to something somehow functionally equivalent to numbers? But if, maybe if the... I, the if, if I may, yes, you please. know, the, the essence of, of numbers is a perceptual system that we have learned how to manipulate materially. Uh, and express linguistically. Um, we have other perceptual domains that we um, exploit in similar ways. Music is a really good example. Uh, we have learned to take uh, control of the production of sound in very interesting ways and, and very interactive ways. Uh, you know, whether it's just a single person playing for their, for their own uh, ears or, you know, large symphonies with large audiences. Um, that's another perceptual system that we have, we have learned to um, ex exploit and, and do so in a, in a very dynamic fashion. But I, I go back to something Colin Renfrew said uh, in one of his early papers, uh, writing in uh, uh, the field of cognitive archaeology, 
talking about weight, that there really is no such thing as the concept of weight without the physical experience of weight, which precedes that concept. And I really am committed to the idea that, that number is the same sort of thing. Um, and so while I, I also see it as a very distributed um, experience, um, pan-human uh, creative process is what I called it on Wednesday, uh, we all have that perceptual ability, uh, but cumulatively uh, coming up with, um, you know, these uh, uh, systems of numbers that are mediated by means of symbols and uh, they have all these, these interesting properties and, and they've become a relational system that, that really have taken on a life of their own very different from their antecedents in, in, in that perceptual experience of quantity. That takes generations of effort. It takes many, many individuals and, it, and, and the system itself passes through a lot of different hands. And that's part of the, the way that it is shaped and ultimately delivered to us. Uh, so, you know, I, I just truthfully do not see it working any other way. It's, it's, it's like a system of literacy. You can't even envision that cognitive state when there's nothing in your current experience to tell you what it is to be literate and and be reading and engaging with the material form that is that is able to um, enter into that relationship with you. So we can't even conceive the 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 end result of of these material forms that that over generations will will be doing these things. That's something that organically emerges through this process of sustained collaborative uh, engagement with that material form. I just don't, I really don't see it uh, working any other way. So, so I'm curious, in the case of music, I don't know this history well, but around 1000 AD, wasn't there a, a moment when sort of the, the notation of music was went from not existing to existing, or am I wrong about that? Well, I don't disagree with the claim that at one point somebody wrote notations for music. Um, that's a little bit different from the actual um, use of the perceptual system to create sound that is then uh, uh, adjusted for pleasant effects. Um, and uh, so I don't disagree with the, the claim that somebody at some point said, you know, let me uh, record. Uh, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned uh, music because music, the, the notation is another semasiographic system and as a semasiographic system bears some affinity with, with numbers as, as another semasiographic system. Um, but but that's, that's a little different. And I, I don't see someone inventing numerical symbols on a, on a par with someone inventing musical notation because numer numerical notations uh, have, have non-notational non precursors and they grow out of that lineage uh, and, and ultimately develop conventionalized forms on top of that. But you can't just start up here. You have to go through the whole the whole, um, because for, for one thing, it's not just a conceptual distance that you, you can't even envision it. So that's a, that's a very big conceptual distance. But uh, the, the, um, the technologies incrementally pace you forward till, you know, if you're making a lot of little progress and by the time you get up here, it's sort of the natural outcome of everything that came before. It's not one sudden genius, you know, sitting down and saying, aha, I can think of this. I just don't see numbers or uh, writing systems that are literate as working that way. Stephen. I, I mean, I think the thing that one tends to see in the history of science, at least I've, I've noticed is, you know, there are things where you know, there's, a, there's technology, there's the conceptual system, both have to advance to a certain point. And then you're primed to be able to have that moment when, when things sort of become concrete. I mean, in other words, there are, I, I agree that there's a kind of a ambient conceptual development that is necessary. Often that has to kind of intersect with the technology because without the technology to actually implement something, you can't concretify it in some sense. But I think one scene, like with mathematical notation, same story. That was a, you know, there were definite moments when, although the, the kind of the precursors of that had to get to a certain point, there was a moment when it became concrete and people actually started using mathematical notation. So I'm sort of curious in the, in the concretification of numbers, of people actually, you know, making a symbolic representation of numbers, whether that was the same kind of thing or whether that was... You know, it feels like that's the kind of thing where, like mathematical notation, like musical notation, there will be a moment when that happened. And I, uh, of course, it has to be the case that there's some sort of ambient conceptual 
development that makes it conceivable that somebody would even think that was worth doing? Well, if you look at the history of uh, early writing systems, and, and I'll again talk about Mesopotamia because that's the, the case study that I know the best. And I think it's one where we have a very detailed material record. Uh, and so you had three-dimensional forms uh, known as tokens that are used for accounting. And uh, they encode both, uh, they, they instantiate, they encode bundling relations. And they also, in their combinations of shapes and forms, encode commodity. And it's probably not the only way commodity was encoded because they could stamp ownership seals on these uh, containers for the tokens. Uh, and you probably didn't even need any of that if it was you and the other guy that you only trade a particular commodity with. And you know if it's from him and he knows it's from you, then you know what the commodity is. It's, it's, it's contained in the context of, of the interaction. Um, and so they're, they're, the, the story goes, the, the tokens are loose. So they, the Mesopotamians started putting them inside containers made of clay. But once you contain them, of course, you can't see what they are anymore unless you break open the container. And now you've got a different problem. So at some point, somebody thought about, well, if I'm impressing them on the outside, I don't need them on the inside. So they made flat tablets and just went to impressions. So there probably is a mix of specific inventive moments and specific insights. Having said that, that is not a unilateral, let me invent everything from scratch. He is not thinking of numbers for the first time in all humanity. He's got numbers, he's got a technology for representing them, and he's making a, a nice and, and significant uh, change in the form in which it's represented materially. But again, he's not inventing the whole conceptual system in doing that. He's made a small adjustment and that, that takes on a life of its own. It gets further refined and take things, takes things in a new direction. Um, so again, I, I see it as part of a, you know, was it Levi Strauss that called it bricolage? We, we take all these bits and pieces of the existing uh, culture, the, the socio-material uh, environment, and we put them together in new, in new forms. And, and it looks like invention, but very, very few inventions can be said to be wholly novel. They are, they are usually um, built, uh, they, they usually represent a much smaller technological difference uh, between uh, what they do and, and what they're built from. Right, but in, it, I'm, I'm curious in the Mesopotamian case, once people had invented the idea of essentially just symbolically represent numbers on tablets and so on, could one see kind of a Cambrian explosion of the use of numbers then? Or did, did it not have any particular effect on the, you know, if you look at, I, maybe there just isn't enough data to know, but I mean, did, my impression is it's like, you look at mathematical notation, that when that was invented, you know, then all kinds of things started taking off, algebra, calculus, things like that. And that there had been, you know, a long period of time when people had not been able to build these towers effectively because they didn't have the kind of, uh, uh, you know, symbolic material with which to do that. And I'm curious whether you can see that in the, in the history of Mesopotamia, for example. Well, I would disagree with the claim that they start out symbolic. They start out being two-dimensional representations of the three-dimensional form, which was based on meaning through instantiation and conventionalized bundling, um, which is different from, um, it's, it's, it's much less symbolic than a, than a number sign like seven that, that we would use in the Hindu Arabic uh, numerals. Um, I, I do absolutely agree that the new system, the, the system of writing, uh, both for numbers and non-numerical language, is, is clearly a revolution. Uh, for one thing, it's more concise than anything that has preceded it, and this allows the collection of relational data uh, in tables. And, and so scribes are now learning these relations. They're learning to think about numbers in terms of these relations. They're able to use these relations in calculation. And they're also able to use non-numerical language to write down the steps in a calculation. Initially, that's with narrative descriptions and it will take millennia for those to become uh, semasiographic signs like plus and minus. But uh, they've got a system now that allows them to record things uh, in a concise and, and highly encoded manner in a way that's historically unprecedented unprecedented. And it absolutely is why Mesopotamia developed one of the ancient world's uh, grand mathematical traditions, because it did open up the ability to explore 
uh, uh, calculations and, and make them more complex and, and apply them to new things and, and think about what they're doing. And tr in the meantime, they're, they're, they're playing games with numbers. They're creating professions around numbers. Uh, scribes become professional mathematicians. So you really have a very dramatic impact both on what's going on with numbers and, and the society that's using them. Yeah, for, for me, as a you know, I happen to have spent my life kind of designing, developing computational language stuff. And for me, this is a very inspiring story because it's a story of what once, you know, when you have these kind of tools with which to, um, you know, th then, then you make something which just uh, enables a lot of things to happen. But I suppose the thing for me that is, uh, is what are we missing today? And this is perhaps a question for other people as well. What are we missing today? that in the future will be as obvious as numbers? What are we missing in the, in the ways to kind of uh, sort of collect the things we're thinking about, you know, into a form, you know, like, like numbers seem, I mean, I, you know, one in the history of, of, of thought, I would say one of the things, you know, universal computation is something which now seems pretty obvious to us, but it took until the 1920s, 30s, 40s for that to actually develop. And it didn't, you know, it almost developed in the 1600s, but didn't quite make it. And I'm just, you know, for me, it's, a, it's an interesting and sort of inspirational question. What are the things that exist today that, uh, uh, one, one question would be, what are the things that, you know, will be as obvious in the future as a way to sort of organize thinking about things as numbers seem to us today? I have, and I suppose another- Stephen, I have a very quick answer to that. My, my candidate for that will be a three-dimensional blackboard that in, it's already possible in VR, but it's nowhere near explored enough. Uh, that, okay. Kevin, Kevin talked about, um, and, and, your, and yourself, Stephen, talked about uh, building these towers of mathematical concepts. And I think that, you know, having this early mathematical notation and pen and paper and stuff like that was a primitive version of tower building technology. And what Kevin is showing now and what the people on Isabel are working on and yourself and stuff like that. These are new versions of, of tower building technology and, and we have universal computation in order to help us with that. And yes, three dimensional blackboards, but also some kind of representation for mathematical stuff, but it just isn't clear what the best sort of representation format is yet. Um, Dynamical and, and notation. Different axiom systems. I mean kind of different reference frames for, for looking at um, mathematical stuff, you know, and, and the, the set theories that Zamello invented and, and all of those lot in the early 1900s kind of thing were one way of looking at things for the problems that they needed to solve at the time. And now, you know, the, the dependent type theory that's used in lean and homotopy type theory and stuff like that are different ways of looking at this issue. And, you know, they, they have the advantage of that, you know, computer scientists have worked on uh, type theories for programming languages quite a long time. So there's all of this automation there. And once we realize that type theory can be used for proving mathematics as well, it's like, boom, we have this tower building technology once again, and we can do so much more in software like Lean. Uh, but there, there are problems there as well. So, you know, we just have to keep on uh, grappling with this problem and finding out what is the best way to balance this uh, human understanding of mathematics, but also getting, being able to harness computation as well. I, I would claim yeah, that, yeah, so, sorry, Stephen, I, I was just briefly claiming that all those systems that you described still have something in common that I think is very universal to mathematical work today, which is linear, mostly linear notation and static notation. I think that going into two and three dimensions and dynamic notation, where you actually animate and interact um, in real time with, with things, that I, I think is a, a, now a possibility thanks to computers and to you know graphical interfaces and stuff like that and VR interfaces. And I think that's how humans have done things with real stuff in the world. And now we have the ability to program them and fine tune them to our mathematical imagination, right? So I think this is the real future, in my opinion. I think you need to prove that, Carlos. I think it's a really interesting idea and direction and you should work on it. I mean, I think that, I uh, you know, the challenge- I am, you know, I am my, working on it, yes. The, you know, in, in, in my life doing computational language design, the, you know, what is the problem of the computational language designer? The problem is you have all of these things that a computer can do on one side, and you have the things that humans understand on the other side. The role of a computational language designer is to bridge those two things. And in a sense, to try and gradually pull the things that humans can understand. You have to start from what humans already know about 
and you can gradually pull them a little bit in a new direction. But if you try and pull them too much, they just can't understand what to do. And by the way, in, in you know, finding a fundamental theory of physics, that's a kind of third piece of, you know, you've got the, it's, it's uh, you know, you have to have something which is, which is both uh, where, where you're trying to take whatever the, the physical universe does and make it somehow, make a language for describing that that is somehow understandable to humans mediated by computers. But I, I think this, this problem, I mean, it's not the fact that something is in principle representable in some way doesn't solve the problem of connecting it to humans. I mean, it's the same thing we were talking about you know, with Kevin just a few minutes ago about, about proofs of um, you know, just having that computer proof. It's not very human connected. And it's not clear. You know, it's just like when the AIs run the world and the AI is just doing what, what the AIs think they should do. And us humans have no idea why they're doing what they're doing. And the world becomes an incomprehensible place. Of course, it's worth realizing we've been there before because you know, when we look at nature, it's just doing what it does. And it's only been in comparatively recent times that we've kind of had the hubris to decide that we actually sort of understand what's going on. Um, but I think we're, we're heading, you know, that's the question of whether the AI mathematician just does what it does and we'll never understand what it's doing, so to speak. But I, I'm, I'm curious in the archeological type direction. I mean, is it conceivable that there were um, sort of mathematical-like ideas that were invented in ancient times that we can see, you know, sort of signs of, but we just, okay, so, you know, I have a, a personal reason I've worked a lot on these cellular automata, and I have often thought, you know, one day somebody is going to unearth some Babylonian tile pattern that is going to be a cellular automaton, and that hasn't happened so far, but my question is, are there things where we don't really understand what they were, they don't fit into our current conceptual frameworks, but they, you know, they, they were an alternative foundation for, let's say, mathematics, and we just don't recognize them right now. Is that conceivable, or do, have, we, have we kind of trolled through the archaeological artifacts enough to know that there isn't anything like that? Well, one of the interesting things about numbers is that they are um, eminently recognizable uh, in, a, in a very distinctive way. And, and I, I think this uh, speaks to the fact that uh, no matter what society you're talking about, uh, there's a great deal of commonality in the the number systems that are that are uh, realized, um, and so I don't I really don't think there's anything numerical that we wouldn't uh, necessarily recognize because today when when we look at uh, scripts that we don't know what language and 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 uh, uh, we we don't know what what the symbols meant but we can pick the numbers out it's just simply because they instantiate and and value bundle. Uh, and we recognize that because there's only a handful of ways, you know, there's a fairly narrow range of variability cross culturally and, and we just, we recognize it. I think part of the reason we recognize it is because our numbers are built on those, those ancient numbers, especially in the, in the Western numerical tradition. But where I find it very interesting when I, when I look at the, uh, the ethnographic data is there are number systems that do things that that are that are that start out being very hard for me to understand as a as a Western number thinker. Uh, for example, in Polynesia, they count by pairs, and then everything is is mentally doubled. Uh, it, but the, it's still a decimal system, and that's where things get a little bit um, uh, difficult for me as a decimal thinker to understand. Because when I count, I count with one item as the unit of counting, not with twos and not with fours, but they had no problem with, with multiple counting units. There's a couple of uh, cowrie counting systems in West Africa where the basic unit of counting is sixes and, uh, and that multiply upscales everything by six. Uh, my favorite is one from Papua New Guinea where they count in groups of four and they um, anticipate the next block of four. So a number like 18 is two towards 20. So the next block after 16 is 20, and I've got two of them towards filling that four block. And that's not even the most strange thing. The next bundle above that is 32, but you, you, you excuse me, the next bundle above that is 24, but you count to 32, then declare you've got a block of 24 plus eight to the next block of, of 24. And, and the logic of this is just so different from a standard decimal system with a, with a, a number line uh, mentality uh, through it that I love the idea that these numbers are sort of dancing all around the number line. 
And uh, Brian Rotman uh, talks, does some speculating about um, uh, numbers and time that maybe numbers that fall off the number line are the way we should start uh, thinking about time. And the, the fact that these um, uh, ethnographic systems are already dancing all over the number line in a way that's, that's very interesting. I, I think maybe there's some, something to explore there that, that if we get outside the, the Western numerical conditioning that maybe there's even more to be discovered about numbers. If, if somebody had binary, if somebody from, you know, 4000 BC had some, you know, stone thing that had some slightly bizarre representation of binary, do you think you would have recognized it? Um, we don't recognize, um, uh, we don't, so when there's a series of linear marks, we don't even know that if that's numerical. There's, there's nothing distinctively numerical about a series of linear marks. Um, there's a lot of societies that do pairing. So it, you're counting things by, you're, you're not so much counting things as you are saying, I have as many on this side as I have on that side because I've put them all together in pairs. Um, in Polynesia, uh, in Mangareva specifically, uh, they, had, um, uh, they, had this, uh, they, they had the standard Polynesian counting by uh, grouping. So it's a sorting procedure. I sort nine this way and one that way. Now, all the ones in the, in the pile that I've set aside, they represent 10 of whatever I'm counting. And I can count them in the same way. And I, the ones I sort out now represent 100 of whatever object it is multiplied by two if it's certain types of items or by four if it's certain types of items. But in Mangareva, they also did that with eights. And now they had ones, twos, fours, and eights, which is a binary uh, sequence. And they come up with, they, they, they realized at some point that you could count the first round decimally. And after that, you just had to group them by eights, fours, twos, and ones. And you had it, you had it all counted and it was much, much simpler. Only now it was uh, not, it was still a base 10 system, but it was a little bit strange because it had gone into this, this binary uh, um, uh, uh, system of, of, of counting. So you do find binary types of things uh, in ethnographic systems. Um, you don't find it being adapted to on-off states in computer chips, though. I mean, to me, it, it seems like you're, you're leveraging the fact that there's unary counting and you're recognizing that things are related to numbers by the fact that at least it starts as unary. That's my question. I mean, my, 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 from the descriptions you've gave, which are very interesting, I mean, all these different examples, you know, you, the fact that it is a number starts because at least some numbers are being represented in a unary way. Is that, is that a fair statement? I mean, just with, with you know, if you have N, if, if trying to get the number N, you have N marks. Um, rather than a binary where you would really not have, you know, you wouldn't be able to see that. You wouldn't be able to see there's lots of the same kind of mark. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, or at least it would work differently and it could work more bizarrely if they had different uh, positional parts of the, you know, binary number represented differently. Well, if you look at the way number systems um, start as, as the perceptual experience of, of really subitizable discrete quantities, you really have one and two, which, which, which uh, you know isn't a one and a zero, but it, it's 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 a two two state uh, uh, um, um, experience of, of quantity. You've you've got two things you can do with that. You can say two and two are the same, or one and one are the same, or you can say one and two are different. Um, and so you've got an appreciation of similarity and differences, and 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 uh, it's it's you know this is this is part of the fact that. Number systems seem to be about evenly split, whether you come up with two as your first number or one as your first number. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're really sort of anchored in that perceptual experience. There's, there's no conceptual uh, uh, framework or capability that just says, aha, I've got a concept of number. It, it really starts out with this experience of discrete quantity in, in very small amounts. I have, a, I have a, one, one comment regarding this. This is all very convincing. Um, but the question is if this is the whole picture. Right? Like if we, um, I, I mentioned this after your talk, I think. Uh, there is this uh, paper by Duncan Watts where he just counted the frequency of numbers in the internet. And so you have sort of some exponential decay from like low numbers to higher numbers um, up to 2000, which is obviously years. 
uh, there are some weird patterns. But then the interesting thing is that more even numbers are more wildly more frequent. Like hundreds are like 10 times more frequent. Uh, tens are, you know, like 10, 20, 30 are like, you know, five times more frequent. 50 and 500 are a little bit more frequent. And then anything uneven in between is a little bit less frequent. So we don't have the same evidence for obviously in the other thick um, uh, notches on a bone, but in, in, in cuneiform script, we can do this. I mean, there's 50,000 tablets. We could just count how many numbers are there and who people actually have some concept of evenness, which would give us some idea about like higher order uh, or, or, you know, like uh, larger numbers than what we deduce from the fingers, which which is a very classic archaeological way to, you know, the, the, the key problem is that our way, how we think archaeologically is equivalent to the uh, sort of um, how we imagine the evolution of the system to go when humans, like any other uh, animal, is not thrown into a kindergarten, they're thrown into the real world, and the real world is messy and presents them with a large number. And so the question is, is there may be different sources one is the one you lay out very convincingly, like in its totality, but then are there other forms of, of numerosity, so to speak? That, well, that, my approach to the archeological record is, is based on what I see in ethnography. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I spent some time on Wednesday talking about a deep history from, from um, Africa and Eurasia and, and, a, and a more recent emergence based on uh, distance from that in, in, in Africa, in uh, uh, Australia and, and South America. So we really get a, a, a temporal spread of, of numerical emergence just based on this, this ancient uh, uh, migration and then the, the demographic changes that, that followed that. So I, I, I don't think, I, I, I have a problem with people that approach the artifacts purely from an archeological standpoint, because you really have to understand what peoples do with material forms and, and, and look at the linguistic evidence uh, and, and look at what peoples are using numbers for and how, how they're embedded in societies and how number systems work. And, and that's, that's, that's my approach to the archeological record. Um, the second thing is looking at these, these post-Neolithic Neolithic technologies that emerge as representational systems, the, the beginning of numerical notations. So when you first see uh, the Mesopotamian material as unambiguously numerical, and this is in the, the mid-fourth millennium BC, you see something that's, that's grouped and has an extent in the hundreds. Um, and, and from this, I would say, I mean, my estimation as someone that looks at number systems is that number system is already pretty well mature by the time we see it um, uh, materially. The stuff that comes before that uh, is, is if, it's, if it's archeological, it's inconclusive regarding numerical, uh, numericalness. I, I mean, notches on a tally, if they're undifferentiated, you really don't have a way of, of, of saying that that's unambiguously numerical. You really don't, because we see in the ethnographic record lots of people making undifferentiated linear marks for all sorts of reasons. Some of those behaviors come very close to counting, like the Australian example where the guy was notching the, the, the handle of his, of his axe every time he killed a guy, um, and then he could just say the names of these enemies. And it's a nascent form of counting, uh, but it isn't really a concept of number the way we would understand a concept of number. And the other Australian artifacts, they, they, those, those have conventional non-numerical meanings. And to our eyes, we can't tell the difference. They just look like linear marks. Um, so you really, you, I think you really have to start with the first unambiguous numerical notations and then what people do with material forms as they are um, taking their first and subsequent steps into a number system and then use that as your paradigm for interpreting the archeological record. Interesting. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm curious, you, you know, the question is, are there any conceptual islands that are detached from modern times? That is, you know, you talk about sort of ethnographic, uh, you know, there's a, there's a linkage between the concepts that we have today and you can kind of back project to concepts that you can sort of imagine were had back in the past. And I'm curious whether, I mean, if you just look at the inventory of sort of archeological objects, um, you know, how much undecoded stuff is there that might in fact be an island of a completely different way to think about what we now consider to be numbers? Or is there no such possibility at this point? 
Well, um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't, you know, we, we have a lot of Paleolithic artifacts, for example, uh, with, with uh, different kinds of notations on them. Um, and some of them are, are unambiguous. They're, they're, they're pictures of animals and, and we can sort of see that they're representing by resembling. Um, we see uh, undifferentiated linear marks and those are ambiguous. What, what does that mean? It could mean decoration. It could mean I just wanted to hold the tool better. So I put some grip improvement in there. Um, it could be something they used to card wool, uh, musical instrument, um, and we really don't know. Um, it could be some kind of calendrical uh, object. And, and what do you say is, is the fact that I can, I can uh, make a notch every, every time uh, and stop when the moon is full. So I start from the new moon and I, and I stop at the next new moon and I come up with a, a series of notches. Maybe I use that in some way um, by, I don't know, putting a piece of twine that, that goes incrementally so I can project how many marks to the next uh, uh, new moon. But is that really counting? Um, and, and so we, we just don't know. We, we, we don't have a perfect mirror on, on the behavior in the past. The only thing I can say is, uh, as a member of the human species, uh, the, the behavior is, is, is widely variable, especially in a social dimension, but not really when it comes to numbers. We're, we're, we're pretty consistent uh, across the planet on, on, on how we think numerically, what we, how we express it in material and linguistic form, uh, and, and the resultant uh, conceptual um, system that, that develops. Uh, it's, it's a very narrow range of variability, all things considered. And the most, the, 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 the biggest influence on that variability happens to be the material form. Um, and, and so, you know, you're really solving the same series of problems as how do I accumulate? How do I uh, make use of that accumulated information? How do I make it more accessible? And within those, um, uh, those, the similarities of what you got to work with and, and, and uh, what your goals and, and problems that you're trying to solve, we, we come up with remarkably similar conceptual systems, one end of the planet to the other. Yeah, I, I find that very surprising. I mean, if I look at modern mathematical notation, there is, it is international. There's only one of it. And you might say, oh, that's because there's something necessary about, oh, we're going to invent a sign for plus, and, and there isn't. I mean, it, you know, that's, it's universal because the spreading time for mathematical notation was short compared to the, you know, reinvention time. That is, one mathematical notation has been, was shared across the planet, you know, starting, I don't know, 1500s, 1600s, that kind of time frame. So my question would be, if you look at the spreading time for ideas, back in the more distant past when numbers were being created. What is there evidence? What, you know, is there evidence as there is, you know, presumably for writing for at least, you know, I don't know what it is, three origins for, for writing. Is there evidence that, that, you know, were numbers invented more than once? And what's the evidence? It's, 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 it's really difficult to say, you know, in, in, the, in the book I published in 2019, I, I noted that the um, uh, unique epicenter is, you know, we see that in writing. Uh, Egypt, Mesopotamia, China, and Mesoamerica. Egypt and Mesopotamia right next door, right about the same time, clearly stimulus diffusion, but very different writing systems. So uh, they're at least uh, in communication. China may be a stimulus diffusion. Uh, Me Mesoamerica is, 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 is truly independent because there's no way to get from, from here to there. But you have to understand that before these Neolithic buildups, uh, demographic buildups, um, what you have are sparse populations living very traditional lifestyles, um, probably in more communication across landscapes than we tend to give them uh, credit for. Uh, but uh, there isn't a large need for numbers. They, they are not sitting down and, and inventing mathematical systems uh, because it isn't pertinent to, to the way they live their lives. It isn't until you, you see the, the post-Neolithic notational systems and the emergence of, of professional uh, uh, disciplines that are that are engaging with numbers on, on a on a on a significant basis uh, that you really start to get some of these uh, mathematical developments. Is 
so one 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 uh, possibility for emergence is, is independent invention. Another is very deep time and spreading, and and that's that. Uh, idea that that numbers from one to five in some language families are very, very old. That's not true in all language families, because when we look at places like South America and Australia, then um, they seem to be, you know, these number terms seem to be emerging fairly recently. Um, and then the third alternative would be some mix of the two where, and, and numbers, numbers are promiscuous. Numbers, numbers spread between cultures and across languages with, with an unusual rapidity. Uh, and, and so um, uh, they, 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 they jump and they change and they influence each other. And you can see this in the way terms are borrowed, uh, material forms are borrowed, and uh, structure is altered in, in the, uh, the, the, the mix of things. But going back to your, your question about, you know, the, like the invention of, of a plus sign and how quickly that spread, I just note that, you know, the Mesopotamians were, were uh, by, the, by 2000 BC, uh, so 3000 years earlier, they were starting to write down narrative, de narrative descriptions that would eventually lead to the invention of that plus sign. So that's, you know, however quickly that plus sign spread once it was invented, it took us three millennia to get to its invention after we were doing formalized edition. Absolutely. Right. No, I agree. But I, I, I mean, I, 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 it's just my, my point is the, the formalization of numbers, so to speak, which is, I think, the large part of what we're talking about. I, I mean, I, I, th I think you answered uh, you know, quite, quite well that, that particular thing. I'm, I'm, I'm curious in, in, you know, looking at the archaeological artifacts and looking at, you know, how many Antikythera devices are there out there where we see it and it takes us a long time to understand what on earth it could be and it waits, you know, how, how, many, how many undescribed, un, unexplained, kind of uh, uh, somewhat repeated kind of uh, structural arrangements are there? And I'm also curious, and if you look at the history of archaeology, and the rate at which people sort of explain, oh, this was a that type thing, would we expect, if there was an island, if there was a conceptual island out there, um, could we say something about, you know, will it ever be, you know, is it, is it the case? And I, my impression is that it isn't the case, that people are, uh, you know, in the last hundred years or something, maybe I'm wrong about this, the amount of, oh, we now understand what this thing is, and it is this conceptual system, and we didn't understand that before. That hasn't been terribly common in archaeology, has it? Or, or am I wrong about that? There, there are still um, things that archaeology is very bad at interpreting. Um, and these are things with cultural meanings that are not in, intuitive uh, from the material form. To some extent, and, and, and let me just clarify by saying, the claim is not that the material form and the concept of number are isomorphic. Uh, because give you an example, four, four loose tokens to the Mesopotamians or the Babylonians would, would have a different concept of number attached than the four dots used by the Greeks to uncover the idea of a square. Because the Greeks had an idea of number as a conceptual entity in a way that the Babylonians didn't yet. Uh, but it would take them another millennia or two millennia to get to the point where the Greeks are now looking at internal dimensions of numbers with the same and essentially an isomorphic uh, material representation. But the conceptual difference is, is pretty, pretty significant. Um, but still, we recognize them because they relate to things in our concept of number that encompasses both of those things, even if we're closer to the Greeks than, than we are to the Babylonian understanding of numbers. Uh, and that's, you know, there are some domains like systems of weights and measures that we also see in the, in the, in the post-Neolithic uh, time frame where we have a physical experience of weight and we understand you know, the desire to weigh things out. And, and so when we find a system of, of measures and, and, and weights, then we understand it because our, our uh, social experience, our cultural experience is, is, still, is still doing that. Uh, but when we go into the caves of, of you know, the Pyrenees and, and we look at the representational art, we recognize what it is, but what it meant to the society, you know, we can we can we can speculate about esoteric you know practices and formalized religion and shamanistic roles, but we don't really know that. The, the, that's not that's not um, accessible from the form that is there in a way that 
a system of weights or a, a system of numbers is. That's, there's, there's really these three things, right, which sort of has, have been established since like sort of the 20s in, in, in cultural history. There's, there's on the one hand the form, like we find stuff, like some pot chart with something on it. Um, then number two, there may be some, some theory, some, 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 some convention that this follows, which may be something we imply as archaeologists or, or, or other people. Um, and then there is this other thing, which is the most, the hardest to get to, which is the actual meaning in essence, right? And so one of the interesting things is that this meaning, um, number is really a special case, just like language is a special case. Uh, but in general, that meaning is probably neither linguistic nor quantitative, but there's all sorts of other stuff going on. And so I think this is, is, a, is a really good loop back to this idea of, you know, Leibniz was mentioned like more than once today. Um, what fascinates me most about um, uh, there's so many things going back to Leibniz is how clear he formulates that already. He says, math should not be, uh, you know, the, the foundation of math should not be quantitative, it's not of number, it's qualitative, it's of relations. And he's very specific about what, what kind of relations. He says, order, similarity, which is in essence what Kevin was talking about. Like, order is like, you establish this kind of functional order. Similarity is, okay, so these five fingers are now the same thing as my one to five. And then Leibniz says, relationibus, uh, or relationis, um, et cetera, expressed in universal ways. So basically in, in all kinds of relations. And what people did in the 20s is to say, okay, so this thing is really interesting because if there's one difference between um, animals and humans is that we have all these different reference systems. We, just, we don't have just one reference system, but we have social networks, we, have, we connect stars, there is a geographic network. Now there is all these kinds of different uh, sort of like, you know, there's money and currency, they're all networks. And we imagine them readily. They have been developed over time, hard won, but now they're there. And in order to separate them, you actually need a system where that actually goes much further than what Kevin actually laid out. There needs to be different kinds of relations. And the question is like, how does that actually merge? And that I think gets very close to um, this, this thing that we talked about before with the different theorem, uh, theorem proof systems, uh, microbiome, and you know, basically, what, what Stephen, you know, develops in this in this in this physics project, where exactly such different kinds of relations seem to emerge from really really simple rules, and so the question is, how does that actually come to be? And there, one archaeologic example would be the Indus script, where there's two groups, the Indians and the and the British people, fighting about what that means, and then you ask five reviewers, and the reviewer are the ones who have neither stakes in one group nor the other tell you a third story. So there's simply no solution. People have no idea what the actual meaning of this system is. And I think that is a very important point. We have to sort of, we, we have made very, very big process. What Stephen said in terms of like, you know, now we know what the Antikythera uh, mechanism is. Now we know like what, what uh, currently laid out in terms of number, but regarding the meaning we have absolutely no clue in most of the areas of culture, even those which seem very obvious to us, like landscape painting, like brown foreground in a landscape painting in the 17th century is not brown soil. It's a convention. And we no, have no I, idea where this comes from. You know, this whole business about meaning was something which plagued AI for a long time. That is, for example, people were trying to do natural language understanding, and they would say, I'm gonna take this sentence and I'm gonna understand its meaning. Mm -hmm. This was a total failure for 40 years, mm -hmm. okay? And, you know, we ended up backing into a solution to that problem with Wolf Malfa, which is, you know, does natural language understanding, and it, you know, what does it mean that it understands these things? Well, the answer is it's translating the, the random utterance of a human into a symbolic language of our design that can then be computed from. So in other words, we have a hard anchor for what meaning, what it means to have a meaning, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It means we've turned it into this computable symbolic language from which we can deduce lots of other things. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, one of the problems is when, when you say, you know, let's understand the meaning of this thing that's just sort of out there in the world created by humans. Unless you have anchor like that, I'm not sure how you, you know, how you define it properly. You know, or your anchor could be, let's just connect it to a meaning that we have today in 
you know, that we think we understand today. Let's make this thread that connects us to, um, uh, you know, to, to current understanding of things. It's, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the meaning in the abstract is meaningless, so to speak, it would be my contention. I mean, I, I, you know, once exposed to this kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the whole extraterrestrial intelligence business, you know, yeah. one is exposed to this kind of thing a lot. And, um, you know, it's, it's like, what do you put on the, uh, you know, what is the, the guaranteed meaningful signal that you can send? And I think that's a meaningless question. So, so I think you're right. The key thing is, like, we cannot expect that the foundation, that kind of foundation you, 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 you adopt or you develop, is the same for us than for somebody else. And that's a, a classic, on, the classic example would be two art historians um, being really good in spotting if this is a real Van Gogh or not, right? Um, or two radiologists who spot out of 15 X-ray pictures, the third from the left has breast cancer. Um, that is something that is like trained very well, but the, the foundation of why they actually recognize may actually you, be fundamentally different, right? So, so they, they may have they may have different clues of how they end up with very much similar again to this microbiome example, where we may have different species in our microbiome, but actually we're still uh, ending up with the same function. And I think that very much has to do that foundation is probably less rooted in kind of you know, more expressive symbolics and maybe more, and this is a hypothesis or something that I'm really, really interested in, maybe more in, in, in much, much more simple things. Like, you know, how do people compress stuff in their brain? Like when you look at stuff, right? So, so one way to think about this might be the following. So you've got this thing out in the world and you say, I know what its meaning is. Okay, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's, the, what's the proof that that's actually useful? Well, one proof is, if that meaning is some symbolic computational representation from which you can compute a huge number of things, mm -hmm. then you can reasonably say that that is a useful sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, it's just, uh, so I mean, I, I don't think that's, you know, that's not a perfect uh, definition, but I think that's a, a good operational one for mm -hmm. us is that if we can turn it into something where that meaning becomes a foundation from which we can very systematically, just knowing that conversion to that meaning, we can very systematically deduce many other things. Then mm -hmm. it is we can think of it as some kind of solid notion of meaning. Whereas if what we have is just something where it's sort of descriptive and it only goes as far as that description and we can't really build anything on it, then it's a less solid notion of meaning, perhaps. Isn't that, that's exactly the kind of thing that you, as, a, as, a, as a computational scientist, you would say to an artist or an archaeologist you have to observe. But the key thing is what we're doing, like archaeologists, art historians, biologists who go out in the field, is to actually look what's there, because we may actually say something about the boundedness of space uh, by looking what is out there, right? So the key question is, like, does it make sense to look at, like, if what, what you're saying, in essence, you could come up with a way, so you could basically abstract away with every observation, could, you don't need the world anymore. You can basically build it from scratch. And so the question is, What's nevertheless, what's the relation of what you come up with from scratch to the real world? And that is a very hard one thing. So I'm not interested of what kind of meanings it could have, but can we find clues in the, uh, in the stuff we find in the world regarding what kind of meaning it has? And that in archaeology is typically a very qualitative individual thing because so, it's really hard to do. So, so one thing one might think about is meanings and language, right? And, and although I've never worked this out properly, and I'm not sure anybody else has either, this, you know, what one has, what one imagines is there's a sort of space of all possible meanings, and there's a word, and that word kind of lives in, in a certain sort of a cloud in that space of all possible meanings. That is the word, um, you know, some particular word, I don't know, uh, I don't know, um, let's take some, I don't know, set. That's a famous one in English because it just has a lot of different meanings in English. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that would have a bunch of clouds of meaning. And some of those clouds of meaning will be two meanings that are considered distinct for dictionaries but have sort of a, a, a bridge between them where they're not really quite distinct. Yeah. So the question would be, you can, you know, people have tried to do these things of, you know, the word to vec adventure and things like that where they try and use context to map out um, you know, this space of all words and to see kind of what the, what the meaning space of all words is. So, I, I mean, a, a thing one might imagine doing in archaeology 
is something similar. That is, you take all the artifacts mm -hmm. and you ask, can you, you know, just like we can group, you know, all these occurrences of the word set are mm -hmm. grouped into certain kinds of, you know, by their context, they can be somewhat grouped in meaning space. Yeah. The question would be what, what the similar thing looks like for archaeology. If you look at all these different kinds of objects and right. at their context and so on, and then you say, this is a group of objects that are, I don't know what, um, you know, that, that were involved in this, you know, religious practice or something, and, and, or at least which, which, where you can cluster them as these are similar kinds of things. I'm curious whether people have, have done that in a systematic way at all. Yeah, I have two postdocs and two PhD students doing exactly this. Do we hire another one and the deadline is on Monday? <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, okay. I'm, I'll be very interested to see the results. The, There's a lot of discussion so, in archaeology to make sure, to, to try and make sure as best we can that we're not imposing our own categories on, on uh, the, 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 or functions on, on what we see archaeologically, because uh, just because things have a certain meaning to us uh, doesn't mean they had that meaning or function for the, sure. the people that made them 50,000 years ago. Um, but uh, you know, uh, there, we, what we're doing in cognitive archaeology is we're looking at the way things mean. Uh, things mean uh, in numbers, they mean by instantiating quantity or uh, bundling it in a way that's numerically recognizable. Uh, things acquire meaning when we use them for certain functions. Um, a hammer may be a tool that we design for hammering, but the idea of hammering and the object that makes a hammer uh, is is related to the need to 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 pound something without uh, effectively uh, without uh, hurting yourself or uh, breaking the tool, uh, and so the meaning emerges of hammer as a device that can do that that action emerges from that action, um, and that's that's um, that's uh, a, a system of meaning, and and we are a species that 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 derives uh, and, and applies meaning uh, in, 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 in a lot of different domains. I just also want to point out that in, in terms of language, a word like five as, as, as this quantity doesn't emerge in that form. It, it emerges in language, uh, well, it emerges materially as, as, as that many, uh, as, 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 as something I can display without having a word or even a defined concept of it. But when I start getting language for it, I say, as many as the fingers on my hand. That's a very different use of language than saying five. And, mm -hmm. and I, you know, so one of, the, one of the, the things I think we need to do much better is look at the material piece of these systems, understand how they were realized historically, and, and see them as part of the way our cognitive suites work, and then ask, are we content with this? Because it isn't until we understand the system that we have that I think we can really start saying, well, how do we get uh, an idea of number that isn't bound up in quantity in the world and the use of material devices? I'm still, I'm still super curious whether there'll be a discovery one day where somebody says, look at these things that you know existed in these random handprints and caves and things like that. Look, we can, you know, convincingly map those into this notion of something like numbers that were very differently represented than anything that's historically been there. I mean, I, I know from, you know, I'll give you an example. I mean, I've, I've played around with very different representations of number-like things than we currently have. So, for, for instance, I mean, just more mathematically, um, if you imagine just making trees and the trees have, uh, at, let's say, binary trees, and um, at, the, at each node of the binary tree is some operator that combines uh, the, the, uh, the sort of the, the number of, of, um, of, of um, uh, the, the combines the, the edges that come into that node. And you can ask, you know, the, the most simple minded thing to do would be to just say you count things by saying how many leaves are there at the end of the tree. And those nodes just say, you know, just uh, ordinary plus. But you can have completely different things at those nodes, where the structure, where basically successive numbers are represented by, by different trees, but those trees aren't, you know, that you can't, you can't, in other words, different successive trees represent different numbers, but those trees enumerate numbers in a way that is bizarrely different from the obvious one. And I'm not saying that anybody would have invented that particularly, but it's just an example of something where were you to see that sequence of trees, 
you might say, I have no idea what these are. They just look like random artistic trees. But actually, they are, by virtue of this kind of procedure, actually representations of successive integers. And I'm just sort of curious because I think it's a good exercise for us to understand, you know, as we try and sort of build out what's possible in science to see, you know, what, what things might we have missed and, you know, can we, can we get clues from, from things like archaeology about that? I just, that was just my, um, uh, uh, just, just curious about that. There's a well-known but historically poorly understood relationship between numerical elaboration and socio-material cult, uh, cultural elaboration. So, uh, you know, uh, simple societies have simple numbers and, and complex societies can develop complex numbers. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a field, uh, not just archaeology, but linguists uh, and ethnographers have recognized that there's this relationship between number system elaboration and, and cultural elaboration. My own explanation for this is, is twofold, uh, you know, and, and, and looking in the, in the context of, of Neolithic uh, demographic increase, which is really where the whole, whole thing starts to intensify. So pre-Neolithic conditions, you, you, you tend to have very simple number systems and you get that demographic buildup, you get the motivation to uh, invest in numbers and, and, and use them as a technology, and, and then they start to start to elaborate. But um, within, within that field of elaboration, um, you've, you've still got a very specific set of, of constraints in terms of, you know, it's an embedded process that reflects what you need to do in your daily life, and it's, and it's built out of uh, the things that are around you. And, and this is one of the, the, the reasons I, I think there is this relationship is the idea from the creativity literature of a, of a materials shed. So when, I don't know, industrial designers are trying to get their uh, designers to, uh, to have new ideas, they take them into a room full of random stuff that has nothing to do with the design problem. And, you know, it's thought that the exposure to random textures and different shapes might shake the shake loose some uh some kind of some kind of new idea so it isn't necessarily just the motivation to uh use numbers and it isn't necessarily just uh you know all the different people that are there to to to, to group think with you uh and it isn't necessarily just a habitual turn to material uh forms as as a as a problem solving methodology um it's also this idea that that material culture writ large uh, acts as a giant materials shed to, to give you potential ideas that then you can uh, in, in input into the, the design that you're, that you're trying to create. Those conditions really don't obtain until the Neolithic. And so I don't think, uh, you know, under, under the way I've just laid it out, I don't think we're gonna find something very surprising pre-Neolithic Post Neolithic, what we do find and have found up to now is is some very surprising variability in in uh, numerical thinking. But again, I haven't seen anything yet that I can't explain on the basis of the material forms they're using. So the the form itself or the behavior with the form is 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 able to explain every 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 number system I've encountered up to now. I think it's just really really hard to recognize. I mean, I was curious. I I went back a few years ago. I was curious to look through Leibniz's archive to see whether he'd invented Turing machines, because I realized it's pretty hard. You know, it's very hard to tell something like that. And, um, uh, you know, similarly, uh, you know, uh, my little cellular automaton things, they would be easier to recognize in some, you know, and I've, 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 uh, uh, it's always my, you know, whenever I go see an archaeological museum or something, I'm always looking at all these artifacts in case there's one where somebody says, you know, peculiar, not understood decoration. And it will turn out to be a cellular automaton, but so far that hasn't happened. But I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious whether anybody has sort of bucketed together all of the peculiar, not understood decorations that seem to have structure, but we just don't know what the structure represents. There or whether, a, I mean, what? Yeah, go ahead. There is a very, very um, important point. Art historians are not trained to see that. Like, if you look at like the plan for uh, New St. Peter's by Bramante or Michelangelo, the thing that they actually built, 
um, one could make an argument there's some fractality in there. Obviously, there is some discussion going back and forth, and so they ended up with particular things. But nevertheless, there is a sort of nested pattern going on. Similarly, uh -huh. one finds, uh, you know, something like Sierpinski triangles or like, you know, the circular version of, you know, you have a large circle and then you have smaller circles around you, smaller circles. Like, how does this uh, come to be? It's like uh, the, in, in Roman times, they had like large slabs of colored marble from all over the Roman Empire because they actually governed the place. And then at some point, they had to reuse these large slabs, so they cut them into smaller pieces. As everything you cut into smaller pieces, you end up with a kind of like sort of tail frequency distribution of like size uh, sizes of the stones. And then, you know, around a thousand, somebody makes nice little floors out of them that look fractal because they basically put a large thing there, put four small things in the corner and stuff like that. So this the question is like at one point, at which point does that actually become very conscious? And so the key problem is art historians are absolutely not trained to do so. So I, when I was a PhD student at Max Planck in 20, 2003, I remember there was a, a, a PhD from MIT where somebody said, all these Renaissance central ground plans are actually sort of like, they look like fractals and like wrote down the equations and stuff like that. And then all the art historians sitting around me, it was actually a really bad PhD, I have to say, but they, you know, they basically rejected that. Like, straight out of the door. They didn't even look at it because it was not the language they spoke. If you speak to people who are trained in looking at objects and say, okay, I'm not talking about archaeology, I'm talking about art history. Um, here's a here's a Paola frequency distribution, here's an exponential with a Paola tail or whatever. It's not a category they think in and so therefore they cannot recognize it. In the same way, they couldn't recognize these patterns, they couldn't recognize the frequency. <laughs> yeah couldn't recognize a number system. That's the problem. You know, I think I have, might have a good example of this. I was, I was very curious, what was the first place where a nested pattern like a Sapinski had appeared? Mm -hmm. And there are these cosmati, these uh, family of mosaic makers yeah. who lived around 1200. And yeah. um, the, the thing that was, uh, and these art historians have written lots of books about the cosmati. And they observe, you know, they made pictures of lions, they made pictures of this and that and the other. And right there in the middle of those are all these listed patterns very distinct from the periodic patterns which the Cosmati also made. So mm -hmm. I went on a bit of a hunt to try and find out, you know, when and where was the listed pattern invented. And I believe I found it. I believe there is a crypt in a church <laughs> in Anagni in Italy. Maybe somebody is close to there. They can go check it out. And in that crypt, there were basically they were doing experiments, you know, laying out tiles in this form and that form and the other. And uh, you can see that they did a piece of a Sapinski and then they did a bigger Sapinski and then mm -hmm. they kind of got it. And what's mm -hmm. kind of interesting is that was, I think, 1210 AD, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, uh, you know, there are actual signatures there in stone. Yeah. And you can actually tell there's a person named Cosma Cosmati, I think, yes, yeah. um, who, um, uh, who I think, um, uh, you know, who I think one can say was the person who figured out you know, in that instance, although the, the, the idea was lost for 600 years after that, but mm -hmm. figured out this idea of nesting. And it's kind of cool because, I, again, somebody should do this more carefully than I did it. But, um, and it was one of these, you're not allowed to take pictures here type things. Um, and, uh, but I did, um, but I haven't you, published them. In, you, 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 cannot take pictures, but you can keep the picture once you took it. Stephen, could What's you take it? Could you yeah. It's a place called Anagni, a n a Anag A N A G N I. It's about. Um, uh, it was the place where the popes, the popes have been expelled from Rome for some period of time around the 1200s, and they went there. And um, it uh, and that that family of mosaic layers, the Cosmati. There are art history books about them, and there's their genealogy is known. And they went as far away as Westminster Abbey, for example. They they laid a uh, mosaic there, which also has some fractal stuff in it. Um, but I mean, the thing that was remarkable to me is, first of all, because it happens to be in stone, you know, I think you can actually see, you know, where the thing was invented and it's left for all time. So, but then the other shocking, go ahead. Yeah, there's, there's one other thing which I think we can now approach this as a society, which is um, like when I did my PhD early 2000s, um, I, did, I, I, I decided not to read the literature, of course I also read the literature, but I did not spend all my time in the library, I went to the photo library, and I just stared at tens of thousands of, paint, of drawings, and then I could actually go to the, you know, the, to the uh, auction catalogs and look at like, the weekly issue of Unknown Ruin, 
And uh, at the end, I got pretty good at it, like a trained neural network, sort of stupid from a scholarly point of view, but actually, you know, just like a ResNet 50 network trained on ImageNet, in essence, only I was trained on Ruin. I could flip through the Christie's catalog and said, okay, this is this uh, pile of rocks in Naples, that's this pile of rocks there. And I got pretty good at that. And so the key problem is, obviously you can't scale that and regular art historians were not trained for that. But what my idea back then was to say, okay, I wanna do this as a human because at some point machines will be able to do so, but nobody will be able to explain why actually machines are able to do and what are the questions we can ask. So I wanted to go through the process and I think that's exactly what we need to do now. We need to look at all the published material, all the pictures about artworks, archeological documents, stuff like that, but including what's in the basement. Like not just the yeah. nice ones where you see a lion on the Cosmati mosaic, but we want to have all the Cosmati mosaics. And then we can look at pattern. And the good news is you don't need to train art historians to do that kind of work because now we have neural networks. We can actually look at them at scale. And that's really cool. I think. Yeah. If you know a corpus, we should just do it. You should just do it. We've got the tools. We've got the tools to do that. It would be pretty easy. The, the issue is finding the corpus where people have bothered to put online the photographs of things where they say, we don't understand yeah. what this is. Actually, you know, I had a yeah. true hurdle is peer review and uh, evaluation for funding. You, you, if you do that kind of thing, there is out of 13 people uh, evaluating you, there's 12 who are qualitative art historians who say, right. that's, well, that's, like a, that's, that's a different problem. That's, that's, that's not the story of my life. I've, I've, <laughs> I've chosen a different path. Yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's, uh, <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, I have to say about neural nets and things, I, one little experiment that I was hoping to do, and I've never gotten around to doing it, is the following thing. So, you know, you, you train an object identification network, and you train it using modern categories. And then you say, let me use only words that appear in a Greek dictionary. That is only things that existed in antiquity. And you ask the question, given, you know, that you train the thing only on objects that existed in antiquity, what would it say some modern objects are? Given, you know, given, in other words, what things in antiquity look like modern, what, what, would, what, would, what would, you know, if you transported Aristotle to the present day, what would he think various things that exist in the world today actually are? Anyway, I never did that experiment. It's, it's an easy experiment to do, but it, it, it's, um, uh, that, that's, the, that's the converse of, of what you're talking about, which is, can we find categories of objects that do not exist in the world today that yeah. are, are, that exist in the, you know, that we can, you know, by some kind of, uh, you know, cluster analysis type thing, we can say there's a cluster over here that is just not identified, you know, that doesn't correspond to anything that we know today. Yes, um, people have done this. There's a guy called El Gamal at Rutgers University who's done this. Unfortunately, I have to leave because there's another yeah, person so do I. waiting for me since 12 minutes. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Yeah. It's it's awesome. Same here, same here. It, it's, uh, it's great to chat with all of you guys. The, Thank you for all this. Uh, for, for all the talks, for all the organizations, and for these long discussions for everybody. So thank you very much. Great conference. Well done, Carlos, L Laura, and everybody else. Thank you very Bye much. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maximiliano and Stephen. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Marcelo. I guess I'm going to see you next week during the uh, workshop. Yes. At least me. All right. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe just one quick question. Um, at what level is the talk supposed to be pitched? What am I supposed to presuppose? Is it just for a, an interdisciplinary audience or can I assume that, yeah? Yeah, I mean, we will know for sure how interdisciplinary tomorrow, but okay. But yeah, but yeah. I mean, by default, just assume this kind of audience. I mean, it's All right. going to be an how extension. How many people are going to be there? Hmm? How, many, how many participants will there uh, be? Probably around 20. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Well done, see you soon. Looking forward to that. Okay. See you, Marcel. Uh